Works of Gaius Sallustius Crispus, translated by Alfred W. Pollard. Introduction to Ugarthene War. Sallust has himself informed us of the reasons which induced him to write the history of a period so painful in many respects to a patriotic Roman as that of the war with Jugurtha. It attracted him, he tells us, in the first place, as a great and severe contest waged with varying success, and in the second, as the occasion of resistance for being the first time made to the pride of the nobility, which resistance he regards as the prelude to all civil wars which afterwards exhausted Italy and the whole Roman world. The interest of his narration is therefore twofold, both military and political, and his success in bringing it home to his readers is by no means equal in the different parts of his work. In its military aspect, the war with Jugurtha is really of little importance. Some hundred and twenty or thirty years later, in the reign of Tiberius, another Numidian arose, who gave the Romans almost as much trouble as Jugurtha. Tacfarinus, like Jugurtha, had become acquainted with the Roman discipline. Like him, he was always, with one trifling exception, defeated in pitched battles. Like him, by surprises and petty skirmishes, he wore out the enemy whom he could not meet with success in the field. Two Roman generals triumphed for bringing the war to a supposed conclusion, but each time, after an interval, Tecfarnus renewed it with as much and as little success as before, and, as in the case of Jugurtha, it was only brought to a final end by his death, after the contest had been carried on for seven years, A.D. 17-24. Tacitus gives us a history of this war in some seven chapters, Annals 2.52, 3.21.73.74, 4, 23 to 25, and it may fairly be said that the knowledge we receive from these is quite as satisfactory as that to which Salus Prolix narration affords us of the conflict with Jugurtha. The materials indeed for writing a good military history of any war in Africa did not exist, and we therefore cannot blame Salus for his failure. If he had had an accurate nap of Numidia to refer to as he wrote, and the accounts of eyewitnesses to supply him with details of the several campaigns, there was no reason to doubt that he would have produced an excellent and thoroughly intelligible history of the war. The vivid description which he gives of the Battle of the Muthul, where he had the account of one of the Roman officers, Publius Rutilus Rufus to guide him, is a sufficient proof of his ability to deal with good materials when he possessed them. As it is, in the absence of all information as to the geography of the country, and with a chronology which seldom extends beyond such references as, after a few days, or in the course of the same campaign, it is impossible to extract from the account of Salist any clear idea of the details of the war. We have, indeed, certain sieges and battles assigned to the several campaigns, but the links connecting them are mostly wanting, and their place is inadequately supplied by repeated assertions that each new tactic of Metellus or Marius reduced Jugurtha to frenzy and despair, and then, after a while, had to be abandoned by the Roman general as ineffectual. Even in the case of the operations which he describes at length, it is often impossible to help feeling that the historian is drawing largely on his imagination, or, which comes to the same thing, is filling in some bare outline of fact which he found in his authorities, from the commonplace book of Roman military description. If we turn now to the chapters in which he deals with the politics of the capital, we shall find much more reason to be grateful to Salist for his history of this period. It is true that his love of fine writing and his pompous affectation of a virtue which he did not possess seriously detract from the value of his work. The recurrence, too, of tags like Palcae quis omina, honesta aquae in honesta, vendire mos erat, gives an annoying impression of pedantry and unreality to much that he says. Despite these drawbacks, however, Salist often speaks of the relation of parties in Rome with all the weight of a practical and clear-headed politician. And for one who lived in the thick of the very struggle which he narrates the beginning, is singularly broad and comprehensive in his views. The period with which he deals is full of instruction. Gaius Gracchus had been murdered in B.C. 121, and from that time down to the end of the Jugurthine War, Senate and Democrats alike did nothing but demonstrate at once their power and their impotence. The Senate could recall Pompilius, uphold Opimius at least for a time, and prevent any further divisions of the domain land by converting as much of it as still remained in private hands at first into perpetual leaseholds, and afterwards into full freeholds. As was shown, however, by the prosecutions of B.C. 110 and again in B.C. 105, and by the election of Marius to the consulship, it became utterly powerless as soon as the mob asserted its will. It could not even defend its successful general Metellus from a most unjust attack, 
or prevent the whole credit of terminating the war, which was really due to Metellus and Sulla, falling to the democratic leader Marius. It is significant indeed that at this crisis of their fate, the aristocracy of Rome could find no better commander than Marcus Aemilius Scarus, a man who, except by some village triumphs in the Alps, had never in his life distinguished himself, whose morality was no higher than that of his fellows, and who, when the storm came, was quite ready to surrender his party so long as he could save himself. On the other hand, the Democrats were not much better. They could assert their power by persecuting the nobility on the occasion of any disaster to the state, but they were destitute of any worthy policy which they could unite to pursue. Their narrowness of view and anarchistic tendencies alienated from them the two allies by whose help they might have obtained a peaceful triumph over the Senate. The Italians, they had made their enemies by threatening to encroach on the domain lands held by the allied towns, and by the disfavor with which they regarded any proposals for a liberal concession of the full Roman franchise. As for the equites or capitalists, the disturbances in the streets of Rome had sufficed to estrange them from the party by whose help they had secured the control of the law courts. These two great powers were content to stand aside and allow the nobles and democrats to decide their battles by themselves, and as a result, the nobles were unable to maintain their monopoly of all the chief offices and prizes of the state, while the mob controlled supreme in the streets of Rome. Such a condition of affairs could not continue forever and the Jugurthine War ushered in the military regime by which it was to be superseded. Not only was it this war that both Sulla and Marius made their name, but the change was effected by which the future generals in the Civil War were provided with armies suitable to their purposes. Hitherto, levies had always been made from the respectable class of citizens, men who had some interest in the welfare of the state, and who looked on war as an evil to be brought to an end as soon as possible. Marius, when starting for Numidia, recruited his army from among the Capitae Sensi, who had no stake in the country, but now adopted arms as their profession, and looked to their general for a reward. Armies composed of men like these murdered their commanders if they had become unpopular. If popular, they would follow them to death. But henceforth, obedience was neither tendered nor refused out of any consideration of duty towards the state. This was a kind of force of which a Caesar could make use. End of Introduction to the Jugurthine War Jugurthin War, Part 1 It's the unfounded complaint of mankind that they're naturally weak and short-lived, and that it's chance, not merit, that rules their destiny. So far is this from the truth, that consideration will show that nothing surpasses or excels our nature, and that it's rather energy that's lacking to it than power or length of days. It's mind that's the guide and commander of life in mortal men. Where this advances to glory along the path of virtue, its powers, resources, and renown are ample without the help of fortune. For uprightness, activity, and other good qualities, fortune can neither give nor take away. Where, on the other hand, it's become the slave of low passions and has succumbed to sloth and bodily pleasures, a short submission to the fatal influence of lust suffices to fritter away strength, opportunities, and intellect in idleness, and then the weakness of our nature receives the blame, and the doers charge circumstances with the defect that lies in themselves. Were men but as anxious in an honorable cause as they are zealous in the pursuit of matters of no concern or profit, and often even attended with danger and ill effects, they would be as much the masters as the slaves of destiny, and would attain to such a pitch of greatness as would make them, as far as mortal men may be, undying in their glory. Men are made up of body and soul, hence all their fortunes and passions follow in some cases the character of their body, and others that of their mind. Beauty of person and greatness of wealth with bodily strength and all other blessings of this kind are soon spent, but the noble achievements of genius are as eternal as the soul itself. Moreover, in the case of blessings of body or of fortune, as is the beginning, so is the end. They no sooner arisen than they begin to fall and decay from the moment of their prime. The mind is pure and eternal, itself ungoverned. As the guide of man, it moves and governs all things. Hence we may be the more astonished at the degradation of those who surrender themselves to bodily pleasures, and spend their life in luxury and sloth, while they allow the intellect, the best and noblest factor in man's nature, to become inert from indolence and neglect. And this, too, when the qualities of mind by which the highest renown may be won, are so many. And diverse. Of these pursuits, however, magistracies and military commands, or in fact any share in the public administration, seem to me at the present time far from desirable, 
since the honors of office are refused to merit, while those who attain them either by knavery or force gain nothing in security, nor yet in distinction. To govern country or parents by force, even where such rule is possible, and is used for the correction of crime, is yet a grievous matter, especially when every revolution is the sure forerunner of massacres, banishments, and other horrors of war. On the other hand, to labor without result and seek no other reward for toil than unpopularity is the height of madness, except, perhaps, for those who are mastered by a disgraceful and fatal impulse to sacrifice their own honor and freedom to the power of a clique. Among the tasks that occupy the intellect, historical narration holds a prominent and useful place. As its merits have been often extolled, I think it's best to leave them unmentioned, and thus escape my imputation of arrogantly exalting myself by praise of my own pursuit, and yet I have no doubt that there will be some who, because I have determined to pass my life at a distance from public affairs, will apply the name of indolence to my long and useful task. At any rate, the men to whom it seems the height of energy to court the mob, and by favor by their public entertainments, will do so. These I would ask to remember the character of the men who were unsuccessful as candidates at the times when I obtained my several offices, and the class who subsequently gained admittance to the Senate. If they do this, they'll certainly consider that my change of determination was dictated by sound reason, rather than by sloth, and that more profit is likely to accrue to the state from my leisure than from the activity of others. I've often heard that Quintus Maximus, Publius Scipio, and besides these other illustrious citizens of our state were wont to remark that as they gazed upon the effigies of their ancestors, their spirits were strongly stirred to the practice of virtue. It was not the wax or outward form, they said, that possessed this power, but the memory of gallant deeds that kindled a fire in the breasts of brave men that cannot be quenched until their own merit has rivaled their ancestors' fame and renown. As matters now are, is there a single man who doesn't prefer to vie with his ancestors in wealth and expenditure rather than in probity and energy? Even the men of no family, who formerly when they won a victory over the nobility, won it by superior merit, now struggle into honors and commands by intrigue and violence rather than by honorable qualities, and seem to think that the praetorship, consulship, and other high offices possess an intrinsic renown and splendor, instead of being only esteemed according to the merits of their occupants. I've wandered, however, too far afield in my sorrow and shame at my country's degradation. I now return to my task. I'm about to write a history of the war which the Roman people carried on with Jugurtha, king of the Numidians, in the first place because it was a great and severe contest, waged with varying success, and in the second because resistance was then for the first time made to the pride of the nobility. And this struggle threw all things, both human and divine, into confusion, and reached such a pitch of fury that amid the passions of her citizens, war and devastation made an end of Italy. But before I set forth how these things began, I will touch on a few points of earlier history, that my whole narrative may be clearer and more open to the view. In the Second Punic War, in which the Carthaginian general Hannibal had inflicted the severest blow that the resources of Italy had received since the Roman power became supreme, Massinissa, king of the Numidians, was admitted to our friendship by Publius Scipio, whose merit subsequently gained him the title Africanus. He achieved many brilliant military successes, and after the conquest of the Carthaginians and the capture of Suffolk, whose rule was powerful in Africa and of wide extent, was rewarded by the Roman people with a gift of all the cities and lands which they had conquered. Thus favored Massinissa ever remained our loyal and honorable friend, and at last his authority and his life came to a common conclusion. After Massinissa's death, his son Macipsa, whose brothers Mastanabal and Galusa had been removed by disease, succeeded to the throne. He had two sons of his own, Adherbal and Himsal, and also reared in the palace, on equal terms with his own children, Jugurtha, his brother Mastanabal's natural son, who, on account of his birth, had been left by Massinissa in a private position. Powerful in frame and of handsome appearance, but especially remarkable for his mental ability, Jugurtha, on arriving at manhood, didn't abandon himself to the seductions of luxury and sloth, but took part in the national pursuits of riding and marksmanship, vied with his fellows in the race, and while surpassing all in glory, at the same time won every heart. He passed much of his time in hunting, and was the first or among the first to wound the lion and other prey. Yet, while thus prominent in action, he was the last to talk about himself. Jugurtha's behavior at first delighted Macipsa, who thought that his merit would add luster to his own rule. When, however, he marked his nephew in the prime of life ever rising in importance, while his own existence was now near its close, and his children were still young, he was greatly disquieted, and turned over in his mind many remedies. 
He was terrified as he thought of man's innate lust for power and rashness and indulging his heart's desire, and reflected, besides, how his own and his children's age offered the favorable chance which leads even unambitious men astray in the hope of gain. He saw, too, that the affection of the Numidians was kindled towards Jugurtha, and he was distracted by the fear that to make away with a man of such distinction might occasion riots or even war. Beset by these difficulties, he saw that a man who had so won the favor of his countrymen could not be crushed either by violence or craft, and since Jugurtha was ready of hand and eager for military renown, he determined to expose him to danger, and in this way to see if fortune would help him. In pursuance of this plan, Macipson sending to Spain a contingent of Numidian foot and horse to the help of the Roman people in the Numantine War, placed Jugurtha in command of this force, in the hope he would meet his death either in some display of his own courage or by the fierceness of the enemy. The issue, however, of his plans was very different to what he had expected. Jugurtha, such was the character and activity of his nature, had no sooner acquainted himself with the character of Publius Scipio, who was at that time in command of the Roman troops, and with the quality of the enemy, than by dint of exertion and forethought, by the most unassuming obedience, and by the frequency with which he exposed himself to risk, who had quickly won such distinction as to be the darling of our soldiers and the greatest terror of the Numantines, he achieved, indeed, that most difficult task of uniting vigor in battle with a sound discretion, though the one in its foresight so often breeds terror, and the other in its boldness too rash a hardihood. The general was thus led to employ Jugurtha in nearly every task of difficulty. He ranked him among his friends, and daily became more attached to him as a man whose advice and enterprise were even attended with success. Jugurtha had also a generous temper, an attack by which he at once united many of the Romans to himself on terms of intimacy. Just at this time there were in our army many men, some of illustrious, some of undistinguished descent, with whom riches weighed more than virtue and honor. By their intrigues at Rome and their influence over the allies, they had attained prominence rather than distinction, and now began to incite the aspiring spirit of Jugurtha by promises that, on the death of King Macipsa, he should have sole possession of the kingdom of Numidia. His own merit, they told him, was of the highest order, and at Rome there was nothing that could not be bought. At last Numentia was destroyed, and Publius Scipio determined to dismiss the contingents of the allies and return home. After awarding the most distinguished presents and praises to Jugurtha in a public assembly, he took him apart to his own quarters, and there privately advised him to seek the friendship of the Roman people rather publicly than through individuals, and to avoid the habit of bribing anybody. It was a dangerous matter, he said, to buy from the few the favor which rested with the many. If he would be content to preserve in the exercise of his talents, glory and dominion would come to him of themselves. Should he hasten too eagerly to power, his own money would ensure his ruin. After this speech, Scipio dismissed him with a letter from Akepsa. Its purport was as follows. In the Numantine War, the merits of Jugurtha have been preeminent. At this I am sure you will rejoice. To me his services have so endeared him that I shall use every effort to recommend him as strongly to the Roman Senate and people. Receive my congratulations, as our friendship demands. In Jugurtha you have a kinsman worthy alike of yourself and of his grandfather, Massinissa. The king, on finding the reports he had heard thus confirmed by the general's letter, was impressed by both the merits of Jugurtha and the favor which he had won. He now changed his purpose, and endeavored to win him by active kindness, adopted him at once, and in his will appointed him his heir, on an equal footing with his own sons. As a child, Jugurtha, you lost your father and were left without hopes of fortune. I received you into the royal family under the belief that my kindness would make me as dear to you as though you had been my son and the result has not disappointed me. To pass over your other great and noble exploits, quite lately on your return from Numantia, the glory you had won shed fresh luster on myself and my kingdom, and your merits drew our ties of friendship with Rome still nearer. You have renewed the fame of our line in Spain. And lastly, have achieved the hardest of tasks, you have conquered envy by your renown. Nature is bringing my life to an end, and now, by this right hand, the honor of a king, I warn and adjure you to hold dear these boys who are your kinsmen by descent, your brothers by my favor. Do not choose the novel friendship of strangers instead of maintaining the established alliance of blood. The bulwarks of the empire are not armies or treasures, 
but friends, and friendship can neither be compelled by force, nor won by money, but only by service and loyalty. And does friendship a closer tie than that of brother to brother? Can you hope to find loyalty in a stranger if you turn traitor to your kin? My part is done in assigning my kingdom to you and them. If you act uprightly, it will be strong. If treacherous, you will find it weak. By harmony, fortunes grow from small to great. By his court, the greatest melt to nothing. It becomes huge Agatha rather than these boys, as their superior in years and wisdom to guard against an ill result. For in every contest, the stronger, even when attacked, is made by his greater power to seem the aggressor. For you at Herbal and Yemsal, I bid you respect and esteem the great qualities of Jagertha. Make his virtues your model, and strive that I may not seem more fortunate in the sign of my adoption than in those I have begotten. Jagertha was aware of the hollowness of the king's words, and the views that occupied his own thoughts were very different. He made, however, a kind reply as the occasion demanded. A few days afterwards, Mekipsa died. End of the Jagerthan War, Part 1 Jagerthan War, Part 2 After burying him with all the splendor of a royal funeral, the princes met together for a discussion among themselves of matters in general. Hemsel, the youngest, was of a headstrong disposition, and had long looked down on Jagertha for his low descent on his mother's side. On this occasion he took his seat on the right of Eterbal, to prevent Jugurtha holding the middle place, which the Numidians considered the seat of honor. His brother importuned him to give way to superior age, and at last, though with great reluctance, he crossed over to the other side. A discussion ensued on many points of administration, and Jugurtha, among other proposals, suggested that it would be well to cancel all the edicts and decrees of the previous five years, on the ground that during that period Mesipsa had been so weakened by age as to have little mental power. On this, Hempsel replied that he was of the same opinion himself, for it was only within the last three years that Jugurtha, by his adoption, had been admitted to authority. This remark sank deeper into Jugurtha's breast than any one thought at the time. Thenceforth, distracted by anger and fear, he intrigued, planned, and indeed devoted his whole attention to plots for treacherously seizing Hempsel. These schemes progressed, but slowly. This, however, did nothing to soften his savage spirit, and he determined to carry out his design by any means that offered. At that first meeting between the princes, which I have mentioned, they had determined, as a safeguard against disputes, to divide the treasures and to settle the limits of their several dominions. A date was fixed for each of these measures, but the division of the money was to be made first. Meanwhile, the princes retired to different places in the neighborhood of the treasury, and it so happened that Hempsel, who was in the town of Thermida, occupied the house of a man who had acted as Jugurtha's nearest attendant, and had always been esteemed and favored by him. Finding this instrument offered him by chance, Jugurtha loaded him with promises, and induced him, on pretense of visiting his own property, to go to his house and procure copies of the keys to the gates, as the true ones were always delivered to Hempstall. For the rest, he said, that on a fitting opportunity he would come in person with a strong body of followers. The Numidian soon executed his orders, and, according to his instructions, admitted Jugurtha's soldiers by night. They burst into the house and searched for the king in every direction, killing some of his attendants as they slept, and others as they ran out to meet them, ransacking every recess, breaking bars and bolts and, with their noise and tumult, causing a general confusion. In the midst of this, 
Hemsel was found hiding in the hut of a female slave, whither at the outset he had fled in his fright and ignorance of the place. The Numidians, according to their orders, conveyed his head to Jugurtha. The news of so great an outrage was quickly spread throughout Africa, and fear came upon Adherbal and upon all who had lived under the rule of Mitsipsa. The Numidians separated into two parties, the larger of which followed Adherbal, while the more warlike joined his rival. Jugurtha armed as large forces as he could, won over the cities to his government, in some cases by force, in others with their own consent, and prepared to assert his rule over all Numidia. Meanwhile, Adherbal had dispatched an embassy to Rome to inform the Senate of his brother's murder and his own position, but, trusting in the numbers of his troops, was also preparing for open war. He was soon defeated in a pitched battle, and fled from the field into the Roman province, and subsequently to Rome itself. Jugurtha had attained his end, and now that he had gained possession of all Numidia, had leisure to reflect on the nature of his conduct. He feared the Roman people, and had no other hope of defense against their anger than was afforded by the cupidity of these nobles and his own wealth. In the course, therefore, of a few days, he dispatched ambassadors to Rome with a large sum in silver and gold, and instructions that, after loading his early friends with presents, they should proceed to gain him new ones and, in fine, should be zealous in enlisting every ally whom money could procure. The ambassadors reached Rome, and, in accordance with their instructions, sent large presents to the king's old friends, and to others whose influence was at that time powerful in the Senate, and thus produced such a change of feeling as raised Jugurtha from the greatest unpopularity into the favor and good will of the nobility. Some of these incited by the hope, others by the actual receipt of a payment, strove by canvassing individual senators to prevent any really serious steps being taken against him. As soon, therefore, as the ambassadors felt sufficiently assured, a day was fixed, and the Senate gave a hearing in both parties. I have been informed that on this occasion Adderbal spoke to the following effect. Senators, my father, Mississa, charged me on his deathbed to account only the administration of the kingdom of Numidia as my own, the real authority and supremacy as belonging to you. At the same time, he bade me strive both in peace and war to serve the Roman people to the utmost of my power, and to regard you in the place of relations and kin. If I did this, your friendship, he told me, would serve instead of armies, and treasures as the safeguard of my kingdom. I was acting in obedience to my father's commands when Jugurtha, the blackest villain on the face of the earth, in defiance of your government, drove me, the grandson of Massinissa, and, by my very descent, the friend and ally of the Roman people, from my kingdom and all my possessions. Senators, since I was fated to reach this depth of distress, I could wish that I was able to claim your help on the strength of personal, not of ancestral services. If possible, that the Roman people should have owed me, for benefits received, a requital I had no need to ask, or, at least, that if I needed your services, I might have received them as my due. But unaided innocence is poorly secured from danger. The character of Jugurtha it was not mine to shape. And so, senators, I fly to you for refuge, to whom it is the bitterest part of my fate that I must be a burden before I can be a help. All other kings were admitted to your friendship after being conquered in war, or sought your alliance when their own fate was in the balance. My family formed its friendship with the Roman people in the Carthaginian War, when we could hope to find in you no more than a loyal though luckless ally. Of these old confederates I am the descendant, and I bid you not to allow me, the grandson of Massinissa, to ask your help in vain. Had I no other plea to support my request than my pitiable fortunes, that I, who 
but yesterday was a king, rich in ancestry, in renown and in resources, am now overcast with misery, and become a needy suppliant for foreign help. It would yet accord with the dignity of the Roman people to prevent the wrong, and to refuse to allow any man to increase his kingdom by crime. But the realm from which I am ousted is that which the Roman people granted to my ancestors, that from which my father and grandfather united with you in expelling Sophax and the Carthaginians. It is the gift of the Senate of which I have been robbed. It is you who are contemned in the wrong I suffer. Miserable man that I am, has your kindness, Mesipsa, my father, resulted in this, that the man whom you made the equal of your children, and joint heir of your kingdom, that he, of all others, is to be the destroyer of your race? Is our family never to be in peace? Must our lot be always one of blood, of battle, and of flight? While the power of Carthage was unbroken, we suffered every cruelty as our natural due. The enemy was close at hand. You, our allies, were far away. Our only hope lay in our swords. That plague spot was rooted out of Africa, and we were enjoying the delights of peace, as men who had no enemies, except those whom you might haply bid us regard as such, when, of a sudden, Jugurtha came upon us, overweening and reckless. In a burst of insolence and crime, he murdered my brother, his own cousin, and then began seizing the kingdom as the reward of his guilt. When he found that the same device failed to put me in his power, he drove me, when prepared for anything rather than violence and war, into exile, as you see, in your dominions, far from country and home. He has heaped want and misery upon me, and has rendered me anywhere safer than in my own kingdom. Senators, I placed my faith in a maxim which I once heard my father deliver, that those who diligently cherished your friendship took to themselves, it was true, many a toil, but enjoyed in return an unequalled safety. That side of the agreement which it lay with our family to perform, we have carried out we have fought by your side in all your wars. It lies with you, senators, to secure our safety in time of peace. My father left behind him two sons, my brother and myself, and thought that his kindness would unite Jugurtha to us as a third. Of my co-heirs, the one has been murdered, and I myself have hardly escaped the wicked hands of the other. What am I to do? whither in my misfortune were it best for me to fly. Every support of my family has perished. My father has paid the inevitable debt to nature. My brother, who little deserves such a fate, has been found foully slain by his cousin. All my family, connected with me, by blood or by marriage, have been overwhelmed by some form of destruction. Of those made prisoners by Jugurtha, some have been sent to the cross, others thrown to wild beasts, and the few who are still allowed to breathe are immured in darkness, and, amid sorrow and lamentation, drag out a life more bitter than death. Had I still all the supporters whom I have lost, or who have deserted me for the enemy, yet were any sudden calamity to befall me, I should still invoke the aid of your house, for the greatness of your dominion makes right and wrong throughout the earth your care. But being, as I am, an outcast from my country and my home, alone, and lacking every appurtenance of my rank, whither shall I go? To whom shall I take my prayer? To the races and beings whose enmity my family has earned by its friendship for you? Is there any land I can approach where my ancestors have not left memorials in numbers of their hostility? Is there any that can have compassion upon me, who has been at any time an enemy of Rome? Finally, Senators, Massinissa laid down for us this rule, that we should seek the friendship of no people save the Roman, form no fresh alliances or engagements. In your friendship, he said, we should find protection sufficient for every need. And, should the fortunes of your empire change, it was our duty to share your fall. By your valour, and the favour of heaven, 
you are great and wealthy all things are favorable all nations obedient to you and so it is the easier for you to make the sufferings of your allies your care one thing and one only do i fear and this is lest some be led astray by a private friendship for jugurtha which they have not yet had time to prove i hear that his envoys are using every exertion and are canvassing and importuning you man by man to come to no decision against the accused in his absence and before the case has been investigated and asserting that i come here with a lying tale and playing the part of an exile when at liberty to remain in my kingdom would that i may see that man whose unhallowed deed was hurled me to this depth of distress playing this part that now is mine would that either you or the immortal gods may begin to take some thought for the affairs of men when that is so he who is now so confident so brilliantly successful in his crimes will be racked with every ill and pay the heavy penalty of his disloyalty to my father his murder of my brother and the misery that he has occasioned me brother dear to my heart your life was torn from you before its time by the hand that should have been the last to do the deed yet i count your lot a cause for gladness rather than for grief with your life you did not lose a kingdom but flight exile beggary and all the miseries that are crushing me less fortunate than you i have been hurled from my ancestral throne into all these ills and stand here to show what human fortune is i know not what course to take can i helpless myself attempt to avenge your wrongs or take thought for my kingdom when my power of life and death depends on foreign help would that death offered an honourable release from my troubles and that i could escape well-merited contempt if wearied out by misfortune i submitted to wrong as it is i have no pleasure in life and cannot die without disgrace senators by your own selves by your children and parents by the dignity of the roman people i demand your help in my misery take arms against wrong-doing refuse to allow that kingdom of numidia which is your own to languish amid crime and the blood of our family after the king had made an end of speaking the ambassadors of jugurtha in reliance rather on their bribes than on the goodness of their cause made a brief reply himsel they said had been killed by the numidians for his own cruelty as for Adurbal, he had made war without provocation and now that he was beaten was complaining because he had failed to inflict a wrong all that jugurtha sought from the senate was that they should think of him as the man he had proved himself at numantia and refused to prefer the words of an enemy to the evidence of his own deeds each party then quitted the house and the senate proceeded to discuss the question the patrons of the ambassadors reinforced by a large section of the senate made light of the assertions of Adurbal, extolled to Goethe's services and strove by personal influence by eloquence and by every means in their power to shield the crime and wickedness of a stranger as though it were their own honour that was at stake on the other side a few who valued right and justice more dearly than wealth gave as their opinion that help should be rendered to Adurbal, and the death of Hemsel sternly punished. Of these, the most conspicuous was Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, a man of high birth, an energetic partisan, greedy for power, office, and wealth, and an adept in concealing his personal vices. Perceiving the notorious and shameless character of the king's bribery, he feared lest such scandalous excess might rouse indignation, as in such a case often happens, and therefore restrained his usual greed. Success, nevertheless, fell to the party in the Senate which let profit and personal influence outweigh the interests of truth. A decree was passed ordering that the kingdom which Mesipsa had held should be divided between jugurtha and Adurbal by ten commissioners 
At the head of this commission was Lucius Opimius, a man of distinction, and at that time of great influence in the Senate, owing to the stern use which he had made as counsel of the nobility at the time when Gaines Gracchus and Marcus Fulvius Flaccus were murdered. At Rome, Jugurtha had counted him as one of his enemies. Nevertheless, he received him with labored respect, and by large gifts and promises, succeeded in making him prefer his advantage to reputation and honor, and even to his own true interests. Approaching the other commissioners in the same way, Jugurtha gained the majority of them. It was only a few who held their honor dearer than money. In the division, the part of Numidia bordering on Mauritania, the richest in soil and population, was assigned to Jugurtha. The remainder, to which its abundance of harbors and public buildings gave the appearance, rather than the reality, of higher value, Adurbal received as his share. End of Juggerthine War, Part 2 Juggerthine War Part 3 My subject seems to require that I should briefly explain the position of Africa and touch upon the races with which we have been at war or in alliance, of the regions and tribes which, on account of the heat, ruggedness, or desert nature of the country, have been less often visited. I could hardly, did I wish it, give any certain account. The rest I shall deal with as briefly as possible. In dividing the earth, most writers have made Africa a third continent. If you hold that only Asia and Europe can be reckoned as such, and that Africa forms a part of Europe, it is bounded on the west by the strait that unites our sea with the ocean, on the east by a shelving plain called by the inhabitants Catabathmos. The sea is stormy and harborless, the soil productive and good for pasture, but wanting in timber while both rainfall and springs are scanty. The natives are healthy, nimble, and inured to toil. Except the victims of wild beasts and the sword, few succumb to any disease but old age. It must be added that the number of dangerous animals is large. As to who were the original inhabitants of Africa, and who subsequently arrived, or how the races intermingled, I know that my account differs from the received opinion. I shall, however, briefly present it as it was interpreted to me from the Punic books said to have belonged to King Hempsel, and as the inhabitants of the country believe the events to have taken place. For the truth of the version, my informants must be responsible. The original inhabitants of Africa were Gaetulians and Libyans savage and barbarous peoples, living off the flesh of wild beasts, or, like cattle on the grass of the field, they were controlled by no customs or laws, nor by any chief, wandering aimlessly about, they occupied such quarters as night compelled. But after Hercules, for so the Africans believe, died in Spain, his leaderless army, which was made up of various races, dispersed itself abroad, as his followers sought to win themselves demands on this side or that. Of his troops, the Medes, Persians, and Armenians crossed in ships to Africa, and settled on the lands nearest to our own sea. The Persians took up their abode nearest to the ocean. They turned the hulls of their boats upside down, and used them as huts, for there was no timber in the land and no means of obtaining it by purchase or barter from Spain, as the wide sea and their ignorance of the language made commerce impossible. Gradually the Persians, by intermarriage, absorbed the Gaetulians, and, as in their frequent search for suitable lands, they had wandered widely from place to place, took the name of nomads. To this very day, the dwellings of the Numidian country people which they call Mapelia, are of an oblong shape and curving roofs which resemble the keels of boats. The Medes and Armenians were reinforced by Libyans, a people who lay closer to the African sea 
while the Gaetulians lived more directly beneath the sun, near to the zone of intensest heat. The combined nation early possessed towns, for as they were but divided by a strait from Spain, they had formed the practice of mutual barter. The name was in course of time perverted by the Libyans, who in their barbarous speech called them Mori instead of Medes. The power of the Persians rapidly increased, and subsequently a part of them, under the name of Numidians, separated from the parent stock, on account of their growing numbers, and settled on the territory round Carthage, which is now called Numidia. Thenceforth, each in reliance on their other support, by the terror of their arms, they forced their neighbors to submit to their rule, and won for themselves glory and renown. This was more especially the case with those whose territory extended to our sea, for the Libyans are less warlike than the Gaetulians. At last, the greater part of the coast of Africa was occupied by the Numidians, and the conquered were all merged in the race and name of their lords. At a later date, the Phoenicians, some wishing to win dominions, others to lessen the home population, urged the commons and such others as were eager for change to emigrate, and founded Hippo, Hadramentum, Leptis, and other cities along the coast. These quickly rose to importance, and served in some cases as a defense, in others as an ornament to their parent states. As to Carthage, I think it better to be silent than to give an inadequate account for time warns me to hasten to another subject. After the Catabathmos, which divides Egypt from Africa, the first place as you follow the coast is Cyrene, a colony of Thera. Next to this come the two Syrtes, and between them Leptis, then the altars of the Philaeni. The boundary of the Carthaginians on the side of Egypt and after this, other Punic cities. The rest of the land, as far as Mauritania, is held by the Numidians. Mauritania lies nearest to Spain. To the south of Numidia, I learned that the Gaetuli lived, some in huts, others wandering about in a more barbarous state. Beyond these are the Ethiopians, and beyond them again, lands dried up by the burning heat of the sun. In the Ugarthene War, most of the Punic towns and the lands which the Carthaginians had owned just before their fall were governed by the Roman people through magistrates. A great part of the Gaetulians and the Numidians, as far as the river Melucha, were under Ugurtha, while the ruler over all the Mauritanians was King Bacchus, who knew nothing of the Roman people save their name, and had hitherto been brought beneath our notice neither in peace or war. The foregoing account of Africa and its people will suffice for our needs. When the kingdom had been divided, the commissioners left Africa, and Jugurtha found himself, in spite of his fears, in possession of the reward of his crime. He now took the maxim which he had heard from his friends at Numantia, that at Rome all things might be bought, for an assured truth, and excited by the promises of the men whom he had recently glutted with his gifts, turned his thoughts toward the kingdom of Adderbal. He himself was of an active and warlike nature. The man he assailed was quiet and peace-loving, of a gentle disposition which laid him open to injury, and one who rather felt than inspired fear. He therefore suddenly marched into Adderbo's territory with a large force, seized many prisoners with cattle and other booty, burnt buildings, made cavalry raids on many places, and then retreated with his whole force into his own kingdom. In the belief that indignation 
would make his victim avenge his wrongs by arms, and that such a step would give rise to war. Adable, however, feeling himself no match for Jugurtha in arms, and placing more reliance on the friendship of the Roman people than on his Numidian subjects, sent ambassadors to Jugurtha to complain of this aggression, and although the answer they brought back was insulting, determined to endure anything rather than embark on a war, since his former attempt had ended so unfavorably. This availed nothing to lessen the greed of Jugurtha, for he was already in imagination possessor of the whole kingdom. Not as before with the band of marauders, but at the head of an army duly equipped, he began open war, undisguisedly seeking dominion over all Numidia. On his march, he laid waste cities and fields, carried off booty, and threw fresh heart into his own men, fresh fear into the enemy. Adabel now understood that matters had reached such a pass that he must either abandon his kingdom or defend it by arms. Under the pressure of necessity, he mustered his forces and advanced against Jugurtha. And now the army of either king took up a position near the town of Serta, not far from the sea. But as it was late in the day, battle was not given. When, however, the night was far advanced, in the darkness that still prevailed, the soldiers of Jugurtha, at a given signal, fell upon the enemy's camp and scattered and routed its defenders, who were but half awake or in the act of seizing their arms. Adabal, with a few horsemen, made his escape to Serta, and had not there been a number of Roman citizens in the place who stopped the Numidian pursuers from entering the wall. A single day would have seen the beginning and the end of the war between the two kings. As it was, Jugurtha blockaded the town and set about reducing it by means of mantlets, towers, and engines of every kind, using the greatest haste in forestalling the ambassadors whom he had heard that Adabal had sent to Rome before the battle took place. When the Senate received news of their war, it dispatched three young men to Africa to go to both kings and acquaint them, in the name of the Roman Senate and people, that it was their will and determination that they should lay down their arms and decide their disputes by arbitration instead of war. Such a course, they were to say, would be worthy both of their advisors and of themselves. The commissioners speeded on their journey to Africa, all the more because, while they were making their preparations for departure, news was received in Rome of the battle and the siege of Serta, though the report dealt lightly with the facts. After listening to their address, Jugurtha replied that nothing carried more weight with or was dearer to him than the authority of the Senate. From his early manhood, he said, he had used every effort to win the approval of the good. It was his merit and not any cunning devices that had recommended him to the noble Scipio. These same qualities, and not any lack of children of his own, had caused Mesipsa to adopt him into the royal family. For the rest, the more proofs he had given of his devotion and energy, the less was he inclined to submit to wrong. Adabal had conspired to take his life, and on discovering the plot, he had taken up arms against his guilt. The Roman people would be acting neither rightly nor for their own interests if they had hindered his exercise of the law of nations. Lastly, he was intending shortly to send ambassadors to Rome to explain the whole state of affairs. After this, they separated. Adabal, the commissioners, had no means of addressing. Jugurtha, as soon as he judged that they had left Africa, finding it impossible on account of its situation to take Serta by storm, threw a rampart and trench round its walls, raised and garrisoned towers, and while assailing the town, 
night and day by attacks both open and disguised, held out to the guardians of its walls now promises and now threats, roused his men to courage by his exhortations, and in fine showed himself bent on making every possible provision. Meantime, Adabel perceived that his fortunes were desperate, his enemy implacable, himself without hope of help, and that, from lack of the requisite means, the war could not be prolonged. He therefore chose the two most enterprising of his fellow fugitives to Serta, and, by large promises and pitiful allusions to his own plight, encouraged them to make their way by night through the enemy's lines to the nearest point on the coast and thence to Rome. In a few days the Numidians carried out his orders and Adabo's letter was read in the Senate. Its purport was as follows. It is through no fault of mine, Senators, that I send so often to you to implore your help. I am compelled to do so by the violence of Jugurtha, who has been seized with such a passion for my destruction, that unmindful alike of yourselves and of the immortal gods, he prefers my blood to all else beside. Hence it is that I, the friend and ally of the Roman people, have now been besieged for more than four months and that neither the services of my father Messipsa nor your decrees avail me aught. I am pressed by sword and famine, by which the harder I cannot say. My previous fortune dissuades me from writing more about Jugurtha. I have already discovered how little the wretched are believed. It may be, however, that I am right in my conviction that my foe is aiming at a higher mark than myself, and that he does not expect to retain at once your friendship and my kingdom. Which of the two he holds of more importance is obvious enough. He began by murdering Hempsall, my brother, and then ousted me from my ancestral kingdom. These wrongs, I admit, were personal to myself and did not touch you. But now he is in armed possession of a kingdom which belongs to you, and is keeping me, whom you made ruler over the Numidians, a close prisoner. How little weight he attaches to the words of your commissioners, my danger may serve to show. What means then of moving him is there, other than the might of Rome? For myself, I could wish that the words I am now writing and those in which I once made my complaint in the Senate, told an idle story, rather than that they should be confirmed at the cost of my own misery. But as I was born to give Jugurtha scope for the display of his wickedness, I crave no relief from death or hardship. I only seek to be saved from the tyranny of an enemy and bodily torture. Make what provision you will for the kingdom of Numidia, for it is your own, but rescue me from this unhallowed grasp. This I entreat of you by the dignity of your empire, by the loyalty of your friendship, and by whatever memory of my ancestor, Massinicia, still lingers among you. On the reading of this letter, some proposed the despatch of an army to Africa for the immediate rescue of Adderbal, and that meanwhile they should discuss Jugurtha's conduct in disobeying the commission. Every effort, however, was used by the king's old partisans to prevent such a decree being passed, and, as generally happens, the public good was overruled by private interests. Commissioners, however, were sent to Africa of a more advanced age, of noble birth, and who had filled high offices of state. Among their number was the Marcus Scaurus, of whom I spoke above, a man who had been consul and at that time was leader of the Senate. The matter was exciting audium, and the prayers of the Numidians were urgent. 
The ambassadors therefore embarked on the third day, and after a quick passage to Utica, sent a dispatch to Jugurtha, commanding his immediate attendance in the province, and announcing their commission to him from the Senate. Jugurtha, on hearing that men of distinction, whose influence in Rome he knew by report, had come to bar his proceedings, was at first greatly disturbed, and wavered between the impulses of fear and passion. He was afraid of the anger of the Senate, should he fail to obey the commissioners. While the vehemence of his desire blindly hurried him along to complete his crime, the result in his covetous nature was the victory of the evil course. Encircling Serta with his army, he strained every nerve to force his way into the town, and was filled with hope that, could he divide the strength of the enemy by assault or stratagem, victory would fall to his lot. His efforts failed, and he could not attain his object of seizing Adderbal before meeting the commissioners. Fearful, therefore, lest further delay should anger Scaurus, of whom he was most afraid, he entered the province attended by a few horsemen. But though serious threats were uttered in the name of the Senate, if he did not raise the siege, after much parleying, the commissioners departed without having effected anything. When this news reached Serta, the Italians, whose courage was defending its walls, confident that the greatness of the Roman people would secure their safety on a surrender, advised Adderbal to deliver up himself and the town to Jugurtha, only bargaining for his life, and leaving everything else to the care of the Senate. Adderbal judged any course preferable to reliance on the word of Jugurtha, yet saw that should he resist, his advisers had power to compel, and therefore made the surrender. Jugurtha's first act was to torture and put him to death. Next he made an indiscriminate massacre of all the adult Numidians and the traitors as they came in contact with his troops. When this was known in Rome and the matter began to be discussed in the Senate, the old supporters of the king attempted by wasting time over questions and quarrels and by the exercise of private influence to soften the enormity of the offense. Indeed, had not Gaius Memmius, a tribune elect, an active man, and an enemy to the power of the nobility, apprised the people that their object was to enable a few partisans to gain Jugurtha pardon for his crime by the delay of the inquiry, all public feeling against the king would have subsided. Such was the power of his wealth and influence. The Senate, however, conscious of its guilt, feared the people, and in accordance with the Sempronian law, Numidia and Italy were assigned to the consuls of the next year as their provinces. The consuls elected were Publius Scipio Nasica and Lucius Calpurnius Bestia. Calpurnius received Numidia in Scipio, Italy. An army was then levied for service in Africa. And pay and what else was needed for the conduct of the war voted. Jugurtha received the news of all this with great surprise. So firmly planted in his mind was the belief that at Rome everything could be bought. He now sent his son and two intimate friends as ambassadors to the Senate and instructed them, as he had done those sent after the murder of Hempso, to attack every soul in Rome with bribes. On their drawing nigh to the city, the Senate was consulted by Bestia, as to whether it was their pleasure that the ambassadors of Jugurtha should be received within the walls, and a decree was passed that, unless they had come to surrender his kingdom and person, they should leave Italy within the next ten days. The consul ordered notice to be given to the Numidians pursuant to the decree, and accordingly they departed home with their mission unfulfilled. Meanwhile, Calpurnius, now that his army was ready, chose for his staff 
party men of noble birth, whose authority he hoped would shield any misconduct of his own. Among them was the Scaurus, of whose disposition and character I have spoken. As for our consul, he had many good qualities, both of mind and body, but his avarice hampered the exercise of them all. He had great power of endurance, a keen intellect, and considerable forethought, was not ignorant of war, and never dismayed by danger or sudden attack. The legions were taken through Italy to Regium, thence to Sicily, and from Sicily to Africa. After organizing his commissariat, Calpurnius at first vigorously attacked Numidia, capturing many prisoners taking several towns by storm. When, however, Jugurtha began through ambassadors to tempt him with bribes, and to show him the difficulty of the war he was conducting, his resolution, weakened by covetousness, readily succumbed. As colleague and assistant in all his proceedings, he adopted Scaurus, who, though at first, when many of his party had already been perverted, he had strenuously resisted the king, was now by the magnitude of the bribe offered seduced from the path of virtue and integrity into that of dishonor. Jugurtha began by purchasing no more than a delay in the war, thinking that in the meanwhile his bribery or influence might affect something at Rome, but the news that Scaurus was taking part in the intrigue led him to form the highest hopes of regaining peace, and he determined to treat with the commissioners personally on all the conditions. Meanwhile, to inspire confidence, the consul sent his quaestor, Sextius to Vaga, a town of Jugurthus, ostensibly to receive the corn which Calpurnius had openly demanded of the ambassadors in return for the grant of a truce till the surrender should be made. On this, the king, in pursuance of his plan, came to the camp, and after saying a few words in the presence of the council about the ill will excited by his deed and his desire to be allowed to submit, arranged all other points in a secret conference with Bestia and Scaurus. On the following day, the opinion of the council was taken amid an irregular discussion, and Jugurtha's submission was received. In accordance with the command given in the presence of the council, thirty elephants, a large number of cattle and horses, together with a small sum in silver, were delivered to the Christor. Calpurnius then set out for Rome to hold the elections, and peace was observed in Numidia and in our army. When rumor spread the news of the events in Africa and of the way in which they had been brought about, the conduct of the council was discussed at every place and every assemblage in Rome. Among the common people his unpopularity was great, while the senators were anxious and undecided whether they should sanction so serious a crime or annul the consul's ordinance. The chief obstacle to their following the true and upright course was the influence of Scaurus, the reputed advisor and accomplice of Bestia. But while the Senate was hesitating and raising delays, Gaius Memmius, for whose independent character and hatred of the power of the nobility I spoke above, roused the people to vengeance by his addresses, bade them not to betray the Republic and their own freedom, exposed many instances of the pride and cruelty of the nobility, and in fine showed great energy in exciting the populace by every possible means. End of Ugarthene War Part 3《吉格尔汀·沃尔》Part 4 As the eloquence of Memmius was at that period renowned and influential in Rome, 
I have thought it well to set forth one of his numerous speeches, and I shall report by preference one which he delivered at a public meeting after the return of Bestia, somewhat as follows. There is much, Romans, to dissuade me from espousing your cause, were it not that my patriotism is proof against every attack. There is the power of a cabal, your own submissiveness, the absence of justice, and above all the fact that political honesty involves more danger than recognition. I refrain, for very shame, from dilating on how for the last fifteen years you have been the sport of an arrogant faction, how your champions have perished shamefully and unavenged, how you have suffered cowardice and sloth to weaken your courage, and even now do not rise against your enemies, though they lie at your mercy. Even now tremble before men who ought to tremble before you. All this is as I have said, and yet my spirit forces me to oppose the tyranny of the cabal. I, at least, will make use of the freedom which was bequeathed to me by my father, whether in vain or to some purpose, it lies with you to determine. I do not advise you to do as your ancestors often did, and to take up arms against your wrongs. There is no need for violence, no need for secession. Your enemy's own behavior is certain to work their ruin. After the murder of Tiberius Gracchus, whom they accused of aiming at kingly power, they set their commissions to work against the party of the commons in Rome. Again, after the slaughter of Gaius Gracchus and Marcus Fulvius, many men of your station were put to death in prison, and in neither case was it the law but the victor's caprice that brought the massacre to an end. Let us grant, however, that to give the people back its own is equivalent to aiming at kingly power, and that deeds that cannot be avenged without bloodshed are constitutionally done. In former years you chafed in silence at the sight of the treasury being rifled, of kings and free people paying tribute to a clique of nobles, of the highest glory and the greatest riches being confined to them. Now, not satisfied with having committed these crimes with impunity, they have even presumed to betray to the enemy the laws, your dignity, things human and things divine, in fine, our all. And the men who have done these things feel neither shame nor repentance. They flaunt their splendor before your eyes, displaying their priesthoods and their consulships, and some their triumphs, as if they held them as honors to which they were entitled, not as spoils they had seized. Slaves that are bought for money rebel at unjust commands of their masters. Will you, Romans, who are born to rule, patiently submit to servitude? But what manner of men are these who have taken possession of the state? They are the most wicked of mortals, men of blood-stained hands and monstrous avarice, the most criminal and arrogant of their kind, men who would sell their word, their loyalty, their affections, and seek a profit alike from honor and from shame. Some of them find their safety in having murdered tribunes of the people, others in having held oppressive trials many in the slaughter of your class. The worse their crimes, the greater their safety. The fears that they should feel for their own guilt they have inspired in you, in your cowardice. Common desires, common hatreds, and common fears have united them together in an alliance which between good men would be friendship, but between bad is a cabal. Were but your anxiety for your freedom equal to their zeal for power, the state would assuredly not be the prey it now is, and your benefits would be enjoyed by your best men, not by your boldest criminals. To win their rights and establish their dignity, your ancestors twice seceded in arms and seized Mount Aventine. Will you not strive to the utmost of your power to maintain the liberty which you received from them? Will you not strive for it with a vigor made fiercer by the thought that it is more shameful to lose a possession once won than never to have gained it? But what do you propose, someone will ask me? Ought we to take vengeance on the men who have betrayed the state 
to its enemy? Not, I answer, by force or by violence, which is more disgraceful for you to use than for them to suffer, but by legal trial, and the witness of Jugurtha himself, for if he has really surrendered, he will undoubtedly pay obedience to your commands. If he despises them, you will know how to judge of the peace and surrender which has secured to Jugurtha impunity for his crimes, immense sums to a few powerful men, and to the state nothing but loss and dishonor. Perhaps, however, you have not even yet had enough of their tyranny, and like the present times less than the days of old when kingdoms and provinces, law, justice, and judgment, peace and war, and all things both human and divine, were held in the hands of a petty class, while you, you who are the Roman people, conquered by no enemy, the lords of every race, thought it enough if you kept your lives, for who among you dared to refuse the yoke of slavery? But despite my belief that, for one who bears the name of man to sit quiet, beneath a wrong is the deepest disgrace, I would yet be content that you should pardon these, the wickedest of their race, since they are your fellow citizens, were it not that your compassion would turn to your own destruction. So great is these men's shamelessness that it will not be enough that you have forgiven their offenses in the past. You must also deprive them of the power of offending in the future. If you do not, you will be kept in constant anxiety, for you will discover that you must either submit to slavery or keep your freedom by means of force. Of force, I say. For what hope is there of mutual trust or concord? They wish to rule, you to be free. They to inflict wrong, you to prevent it while finally they treat your allies as enemies, and your enemies as allies. With purposes so different, can there be either friendship or peace? I therefore warn and urge you not to allow so great a crime to go unpunished. This is no case of fraud on the treasury, or of money extorted by force from your allies. Heavy crimes as these are, custom by this time, has taught us to count them mere nothings. No, it is the powers of the Senate that have been sold to our bitterest enemy. Your sovereign rights have been betrayed, at home and abroad. Our country has been bought and sold. If these things be not inquired into, if the guilty go unpunished, what is there left for us but to live in bondage to the men who have done them? For what is kingship but the power to work your will with impunity? I do not, however, exhort you, query taste, to be glad that fellow citizens have done the wrong rather than the right. I only exhort you not to set about destroying the good by pardoning the bad. In matters of state, I must add, it is much better to be forgetful of a service than of an injury. Neglect only makes the good man slower to serve you. It makes the bad worse than he was before. See to it that none do you wrong, and you will not often stand in need of others' help. By frequent speeches to this and the like effect, Memmius persuaded the people to dispatch Lucius Cassius, then praetor, to bring Jugurtha to Rome, pledging the public word for his safety, in order that by the king's testimony, the misconduct of Scaurus and the others who were arraigned for receiving bribes might be more easily exposed. While this was going on at Rome, the officers left by Bestia, in command of the army in Numidia, committed many scandalous crimes in imitation of their general. Some, on receipt of bribes, restored his elephants to Jugurtha, others sold him his deserters. Others again plundered friendly lands. So violent was the avarice which had settled like a plague upon their minds. Gaius Memmius carried his bill, and amid the dismay of the whole nobility, Cassius set out on his mission to Jugurtha, finding the king full of fear, and prompted by his guilty conscience to despair. He persuaded him, since he had surrendered to the Roman people, 
not to prefer to learn their might rather than their clemency. For his safety, moreover, he privately pledged his own word, which such at that time was Cassius's reputation. The king valued as highly as that of the people. Jugurtha therefore came to Rome with Cassius, in a guise so pitiful as to be the very opposite of royal state. He had himself no lack of courage, and was supported by all those whose influence or crimes had enabled him to accomplish all that I have above narrated. Nevertheless, he bought with a great bribe Gaius Bibius, a tribune of the commons, thinking that by his shamelessness he would be protected against both justice and violence. A public meeting was summoned, and the commons showed themselves very hostile to the king, some bidding him be put in chains, others that punishment should be inflicted on him as an enemy, according to ancient custom, unless he revealed who were his accomplices. Gaius Mimius, however, had more regard for their dignity than their wrath, quieted their commotion, softened their passions, and finally protested that, as far as he was concerned, the public word should not be broken. As soon as silence was gained, he brought forward Jugurtha, and addressed him, reminding him of his misdeeds in Rome and Numidia, and laying before him the crimes he had committed against his father and brothers. The Roman people, he continued, were not ignorant as to who were his helpers and agents in all this. They wished, however, to have it somewhat more clearly stated from his own mouth. Should he reveal the truth, there rested a great hope for him in the honor and merciful disposition of the Roman people. Should he withhold the information, he would not save his accomplices, but would ruin himself and his own hopes. Mimius finished his speech, and a Jugurtha was ordered to make answer, when Gaius Bibius, the tribune of the commons, whose corruption I have mentioned, ordered the king to be silent, and although the crowd, which was present at the meeting, in a frenzy of rage tried to terrify him by shouts, by gestures, by frequent assaults, and by every other ebullition which anger is wont to produce, his shamelessness nevertheless won the day. The people quitted the meeting where they had been thus mocked, and Jugurtha, Bestia, and the others whom the investigation was disquieting felt their courage increase. There was at this time in Rome a certain Numidian, by name Massiva, a son of Gulusa, and grandson of Massinissa. In the struggle between the kings he had opposed Jugurtha, and on the surrender of Serta and the murder of Adherbal, had fled from his country into exile. Spurius Albinus, consul with Quintus Minucius Rufus, in the year after Bestia, now persuaded him, since he was of the stock of Massinissa, and Jugurtha, for his crimes, was loaded with odium and fear, to beg the kingdom of Numidia from the Senate. The consul was eager to conduct a war, and so preferred a general agitation to letting the matter lose its interest, for the province of Numidia had fallen to himself, that of Macedonia to Minucius. On Massiva beginning to stir in the matter, Jugurtha, who found no sufficient defense in his friends, some of whom were embarrassed by their consciousness of guilt, others by their ill repute, or their own fears, ordered Bomilcar, his most intimate and trusty attendant, to employ the bribery by which he had accomplished so much, in hiring assassins to attack Massiva, and to kill the Numidian secretly if he could, or failing this by any means whatever. Bomilcar speedily carried out the king's commands, and by means of men skilled in such business gained information as to his victims' journeys and departures, and in fine, as to all the places he was in the habit of frequenting, and the hours which he observed. He then directed the attack as the circumstances made advisable. One of the band who were hired to commit the murder rushed upon Massiva somewhat hastily, and though he cut him down, was himself seized. At the instance of many advisers, and especially of the consul Albinus, this man turned informer, and Bomilcar was made to stand a trial, rather on considerations of equity than by the law of nations, since he was in attendance 
on one who had come to Rome under the public guarantee. Though detected in so great a crime, Jugurtha did not abandon the struggle against facts until he perceived that the odium of his deed was too great for either influence or money to overcome. On the first hearing of the case he had given fifty sureties from among his friends, but now, thinking more of his kingdom than his sureties, he privily dispatched Bomilcar to Numidia, in the fear that should he be punished the rest of his accomplices might be seized with the dread of obeying him. A few days afterwards he himself set out on the same journey, as he was commanded by the Senate to leave Italy. When he had passed out of Rome, he is said, after often looking back on it, in silence, at last, to have cried, A city for sale, soon to fall if once it find a buyer. Meanwhile the war had been resumed, and Albinus hastened to convey to Africa provisions and pay and other requisites for his soldiers' use. He himself set out immediately, hoping either by arms a capitulation, or some other means to finish the war before the date of the elections, which was now not far distant. Jugurtha, on the other hand, pursued a policy of delay, assigning now one cause and now another, promising to surrender, and then, pretending distrust, retreating before Albinus's advance, and a little while after to keep his followers from despair, himself advancing. Thus now by warlike, now by peaceful means, he secured delay and baffled the consul. Some at the time thought that Albinus was privy to the king's design, and refused to believe that a war so vigorously begun was thus easily prolonged by sloth rather than treachery. Anyhow, time slipped away and the date of the elections drew near at hand. Albinus therefore left his brother, Aulus, as pro-praetor in the camp, and departed for Rome. Just at this time at Rome, the state was being violently excited by dissensions among the tribunes, two of whom, Publius Lucullus and Lucius Annius, were striving, despite the opposition of their colleagues, to extend their term of office. This disagreement prevented the elections being held throughout the year, and Aulus, who, as I said above, had been left as pro praetor in the camp, was led by this delay to entertain a hope of either bringing the war to an end, or extorting money from the king by the terror of his army. Summoning the soldiers from their winter quarters for a campaign in the month of January, he arrived by means of forced marches in most inclement weather at the town of Suthol, where the king's treasures were deposited. The bitterness of the season and the natural advantages of the place made its storm or blockade impossible. Around its wall, which lay on the edge of a steep cliff, a swampy plain, had been turned by the rain into a lake. Yet Aulus, either as a pretense by which to increase the king's alarm, or blinded by his eagerness to gain the town for the sake of the treasures, brought up a mantelets, threw up a rampart, and hastily made other provisions such as might forward his undertaking. Aware of the folly and unskillfulness of the legate, Jugurtha craftily fostered his madness, sent a succession of beseeching embassies, and, as if to avoid him, kept leading his army amid forests and bypaths. At last he enticed Aulus, by the hope of a secret agreement, to leave Suthul and follow him in his pretended retreat into remote regions. There his misconduct was to be more screened from observation. Meanwhile he employed skillful agents to tamper with the praetor's army night and day, and bribed the centurions and squadron leaders, some to desert, others at a given signal to abandon their post. When everything was arranged to his wish, in the dead of night he suddenly surrounded the camp of Aulus with a host of Numidians. The Roman soldiers were panic-stricken by the unwanted uproar. Some seized their arms, others sought concealment, others again tried to encourage their frightened comrades. Everywhere there was confusion. The force of the enemy was large, the sky was darkened by night and clouds. Their danger was critical. It was doubtful whether to flee or to remain was the safer course. 
of those whom I stated to have been recently bribed, one cohort of Ligurians with two squadrons of Thracians and a few private soldiers deserted to the king, and the chief centurion of the third legion gave an entrance to the enemy over the rampart of which he had been entrusted with the defense. By this road all the Numidians burst into the camp. Our men, in a disgraceful rout, many of them after throwing away their arms, gained a neighboring hill. Night and the plunder of the camp withheld the enemy from making use of their victory. On the next day Jugurtha, in a conference with Aulus, expressed himself to the effect that, although he held him and his army in the toils of famine and sword, he was yet mindful of human fortunes, and if Aulus would enter into a treaty, would dismiss his whole force unharmed beneath the yoke, with the further stipulation that he was to leave Numidia within ten days. The terms were grievous and shameful. Nevertheless, with the fear of death before their eyes, peace was concluded according to the king's pleasure. End of Jugurthine War, Part 4 Part 14 of Works of Sallust. This is a LibriVox recording. Jugurthine War, Part 5. When the information of this was received at Rome, fear and grief fell upon the state. Some sorrowed for the glory of their empire. Others, in their ignorance of the affairs of war, feared for their freedom. Everyone, especially those who had often gained distinction in war, was bitter against Aulus for having though possessed of arms, sought safety in dishonor rather than the sword. The consul Albinus, in his fear of odium and consequent danger from his brother's misconduct, consulted the Senate as to the peace. Meanwhile he levied reinforcements for the army, summoned contingents from the allies and the Latin citizens, and in fact showed energy in every possible way. The Senate, as was their duty from the first, decreed that without the consent of itself and the people, no agreement could have had the force of a treaty. The consul was prevented by the tribunes of the people from taking the forces which he had levied with him, but started himself in a few days to Africa, for his entire army, in accordance with the agreement, had evacuated Numidia and was now in winter quarters in the province. He arrived there, burning to pursue Jugurtha, and so relieve his brother's unpopularity. But the sight of his soldiers, disorganized, not only by their route, but by the disorder and luxury of a relaxed state of discipline, convinced him that with the means at his disposal nothing was to be done. Meanwhile at Rome, Gaius Manilius Limitanus, a tribune of the commons, proposed to the people that an inquiry should be held as to all persons, by whose advice Jugurtha had disregarded the decrees of the Senate, who had received bribes from him when on embassies or military commands, or who had restored to him his elephants and deserters, and also as to all who had made agreements with an enemy either for peace or war, some in their consciousness of their guilt, others in their fear of danger from party hatred, finding themselves unable to openly resist the bill without arousing their favor for these and similar malpractices, prepared secretly to obstruct it by means of their friends, and particularly by the help of men from the Latin towns and the Italian allies. It is impossible, however, to relate with what determination and violence the commons supported the bill, and this such was the passion that possessed the contending parties, rather from hatred of the nobility, against whom these penalties were aimed, than from any patriotic feeling. While all the others were stricken with dismay, Marcus Scaurus, who, as I related above, had been Bestia's lieutenant, amid the triumph of the commons and the rout of his own party, in the confusion which still prevailed in the state, managed to have himself appointed one of the three judges created in accordance with the bill of Manilius. The inquiry, however, was conducted with harshness and violence according to the reports and caprices which prevailed among the commons, who at this crisis were possessed 
by the same insolence in their good fortune as had so often governed the nobility in theirs. A few years before this, party divisions and cabals, with all the bad qualities they bring with them, had become common at Rome in a period of peace and of the abundance of such things as men esteem the first of blessings. Down to the destruction of Carthage, the people and senate of Rome between them administered the state peacefully and soberly. There was no strife among the citizens for glory or supremacy, and fear of its enemies kept the state to the exercise of honorable qualities. When, however, men's minds were relieved of this fear, as a natural consequence, wantonness and arrogance, the favorite vices of prosperity, made their appearance. Thus the repose for which amid their calamities they had longed proved, when they had obtained it, more troublesome and bitter than calamity itself. The nobility now made dignity, the people freedom, the objects of party passion, and everyone seized, plundered, and robbed for his own hand. Thus everything was drawn to one or other side, and the state which had stood between them was torn asunder. Of the two parties the nobility were the stronger, owing to their power of common action. The force of the commons, weakened and scattered in a multitude of hands, was less effective. All action, both in war and in home affairs, was taken at the discretion of a clique. The same party controlled the treasury, the provinces and civil offices, and the awards of reputation and triumph. The people were ground down by military service and want. The spoils of war were seized by the generals and shared with a few accomplices, and meanwhile the parents and little children of the soldiers were thrust from their homesteads by their more powerful neighbors, hand in hand with power, avarice, unlimited and unrestrained, spread abroad, and while it caused general pollution and devastation, held nothing as estimable nothing as sacred until it worked its own ruin. As soon as members of the nobility were found to prefer true glory to unjust dominion, the state was shaken and civil strife sprang into being like some convulsion of the earth. Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, men whose ancestors had done much to advance the state in the Punic and other wars, first asserted the liberty of the commons and exposed the crimes of the clique. The nobility, in guilty terror, opposed their proceedings at one time by means of the allies and the Latin citizens, at another by the Roman knights who had been drawn from the side of the commons by the hope of an alliance with themselves. First they cut off Tiberius, and then a few years afterwards his brother Gaius, who was entering on the same course, the one a tribune, the other a commissioner for establishing colonies and besides these they killed Marcus Fulvius Flaccus. The Gracchi, in their desire for victory, had certainly shown a too intemperate disposition. It is better, however, to be defeated by a good precedent than to crush a wrong by means of a bad one. As it was, the nobility used their victory to indulge their own passion, made away with many persons by sword or banishment, and for the future gained in the terror they inspired rather than in real power. Such conduct has often proved the ruin of great states. Each party is ready to use any means to defeat the other, and to punish the defeated too severely. But were I to set about treating of party passions, and the condition of public morals in any detail, or in proportion to the importance of the question, my time would fail me sooner than my material. I therefore return to my task. After the Treaty of Aulus, and the disgraceful flight of our army, the consuls Quintus Metellus and Marcus Silanus, in accordance with the resolution of the Senate, had settled on their respective provinces, and that of Numidia had fallen to Metellus, a man of energy, whose reputation, though he was an opponent of the popular party, was unshaken and unblemished. No sooner had he entered office than while accounting everything else as duties to be shared with his colleague, he concentrated his attention on the war which he was about to conduct. 
placing little confidence in the old army he levied soldiers and summoned troops from all quarters made ready armor weapons horses and other instruments of warfare with an abundance of provisions and everything in fact which in a war of variable character and of many requirements is wont to be of service the senate by its influence the allies latin citizens and dependent kings by freely sending contingents and above all the whole state by the earnestness of its zeal used every exertion to complete these measures when everything was prepared and arranged to his wish the consul set out for numidia amid the high hopes of the citizens which were roused not only by his talents but especially by the unswerving resolution with which he resisted the temptations of wealth and by the fact that it was by the greed of our officers in numidia that our strength had hitherto been crushed and that of our enemies augmented on the arrival of metellus in africa he received from spurius albinus the proconsul an indolent and cowardly army unable to bear either danger or toil readier of tongue than of hand the spoiler of its allies and the spoil of its enemies without government and without discipline thus more anxiety fell to the new general from the bad character of his soldiers than reinforcement or hope from their numbers the delay of the elections had shortened his time for a campaign and he suspected that the minds of the citizens were strained with expectation of some decisive action nevertheless he determined not to engage in active war before he had forced his men to endure toil by reviving the ancient discipline stunned by the defeat of his brother aulus and his army albinus after coming to the determination not to advance beyond the province for the part of the usual campaigning time during which he was in command kept his soldiers as a rule in fixed camps except when the effluvium or a scarcity of food compelled him to change his position these camps were not entrenched nor were watches set according to military custom the men left the standards at their own pleasure camp followers mingled with the soldiers and roamed about with them by day and night in their excursions they wasted the land plundered the country houses vied with each other in carrying off cattle and slaves and bartered them away to traders for foreign wine and the like the corn with which the state supplied them they sold and bought their bread from day to day in fine there is no shameful outcome of wantonness and sloth that words can express our imagination figure that was not to be found in that army and more besides i find however that metellus showed his greatness and wisdom no less in this difficulty than in dealing with an enemy. With such self-command did he keep the mean between popularity-seeking and severity. As his first step he abolished by edict all the appliances of sloth, forbidding the sale in the camp of bread or any other cooked food, the presence of camp followers in the track of the army, or the possession by a common soldier of any slave or beast of burden either in the camp or on the march. On all other points he laid down strict rules. Moving along crossroads, he shifted his camp from day to day, fortified it with rampart and trench, as if in presence of the enemy, set numerous watches, and went the rounds in person with his officers. On the march he was now in the van, now in the rear, often too with the main body, and saw that no one left the ranks that the soldiers marched in close order with the standards, and that each man carried his own food and arms. By this course of restraining, rather than punishing offenses, he soon gave stability to his army. Meanwhile Jugurtha, on hearing the report of what Metellus was doing, and being assured from Rome of his integrity, despaired of his fortunes, and now at last tried to make a real surrender. With this object he sent an entreating embassy to the consul to, to beg only his life for himself and his children, everything else they were to surrender to the Roman people. Experience, however, had long ago convinced Metellus that the Numidians were a faithless and unstable race, ever eager for change. 
He therefore approached the ambassadors independently of each other, and tampered with them by degrees. Finding them favorable to his purpose, he persuaded them by large promises to surrender Jugurtha to him, if possible alive, but failing that, dead. Publicly he bade them take back an answer such as might satisfy the king. A few days later he invaded Numidia with an army prepared for fighting, and in hostile array. No signs of war were apparent. The cottages were occupied, cattle and husbandmen in the fields. The king's officers advanced from their towns and dwellings to meet him, ready to provide corn, convey provisions, and in fact do whatever they were ordered. Nonetheless Metellus advanced guardedly, as if in the presence of an enemy, sent his scouts far and wide in every direction, and believed these marks of submission to be a mere show, and that an opportunity was being sought for a sudden attack. He himself, with the light cohorts, and a chosen body of slingers and bowmen, was in the front. In the rear his lieutenant Gaius Marius was in command with the cavalry. The auxiliary cavalry Metellus had divided between the two flanks, under the several tribunes of the legions and officers of the cohorts, in such a manner that skirmishers were mingled with it to repulse the cavalry of the enemy at whatever point it might attack. Such was the treachery of Jugurtha, and such his acquaintance with both the country and with the art of war, that it was a question whether he were more dangerous absent or present, in peace or in war. Not far from the road along which Metellus was marching was a Numidian town named Vaga, the most frequented market of the whole kingdom, and here many Italians had been wont to settle and trade. On this town the consul imposed a garrison, partly for the sake of seeing whether the inhabitants would submit to it, partly on account of the advantage of the place. He further demanded that they should bring in corn and other stores useful for the war, thinking, as he had reason, that the number of traders would both aid the army with provisions and would help to secure what he had already won. While Metellus was busied with this, Jugurtha, with increasing earnestness, was sending submissive embassies, treating for peace and offering to surrender everything except the lives of himself and his children. As he had done to their predecessors, the consul, before dismissing the ambassadors, suborned them to betray their master neither refused nor promised the king the peace he asked, and amid these delays awaited the fulfillment of the ambassador's promises. Jugurtha, when he came to compare the words of Metellus with his actions, perceived that he was being assailed with his own devices. As far as words went, peace was offered him. As a matter of fact, the war was being hotly pressed. An important city had been won from him. The enemy had learnt the nature of the land, and the loyalty of his countrymen had been tampered with. Forced by necessity, he determined on a struggle. A knowledge of the enemy's route led him to hope for victory from the favorable nature of the ground, and, raising as great forces of every kind as he could, by means of little-known paths, he got the start of the army of Metellus. In the part of Numidia, of which Adurbal had gained possession at the time of the partition, there was a river named the Muthul, which took its rise from the south, some twenty miles from this stream, and following the same direction, lay a barren and uncultivated mountain ridge. Almost in its midst there rose a hill stretching to an immense distance, and clothed with wild olives, myrtles, and trees of such other kinds as grow in a dry and sandy soil. Between the hills and the Muthul was a plain, barren from want of water, except in the neighborhood of the river, where it was planted with trees and thickly occupied by cattle and husbandmen. On this hill, which, as I said, lay at right angles to the road, Jugurtha took up his position in a very extended line, giving Bomilcar the command of the elephants, and a part of his infantry he instructed him what to do, while he himself remained at a point nearer the mountain with the whole body of cavalry and the pick of the infantry, and there posted his men. Then, 
visiting several squadrons and companies, he urged and conjured them to be mindful of their ancient valor and of victory, and to shield himself and his kingdom against the greed of the Romans. The men, he said, against whom they had to fight were those whom they had formerly beaten and led beneath the yoke, and though they had changed their general, they had not changed their spirit. Everything which the Numidians had a right to expect from their commander he had provided. They would hold the higher ground. Their knowledge would be matched with inexperience. They would not join in conflict as a weaker force against a stronger, or as raw recruits with men better versed in war. They must therefore, he said, hold themselves ready and on the alert to burst upon the Romans at the given signal. That day would either crown all their toil and victories, or be the beginning of the greatest miseries. Besides this, he addressed singly each man whom he had rewarded with money or distinction for some warlike exploit, reminding him of his favor and pointing him out as an example to others. In fine, he suited his words to each man's character and used the various incentives of promises, threats, entreaties. As he was thus engaged, Metellus was seen descending the mountain with his army, unaware of the enemy's presence. At first he was baffled by the strange appearance of the country, for the cavalry and the Numidians had taken up their position in the brushwood, and owing to the lowness of the trees were not altogether hidden, but yet were difficult to distinguish for what they were, as their own bodies and their military ensigns were masked, both designedly and by the nature of their position. He soon, however, discovered the ambush and ordered a short halt. Changing his formation on the right flank, which was nearest the enemy, he drew up his line with a threefold reserve, distributed slingers and bowmen among the companies, and placed all his cavalry on the wings. And, after a few words of suitable encouragement to his soldiers, led his force in its new formation with the front ranks at right angles to the line of march, down to the level ground, he remarked that the Numidians remained quiet and did not descend the hill, and in that season, and in the scarcity of water, felt a fear lest his army should be exhausted by thirst. He therefore sent forward his lieutenant, Publius Rutilius, with some light cohorts and a part of the cavalry towards the river to seize a position for a camp expecting that the enemy would hinder his own advance by frequent charges and flank attacks, and, in their distrust of the sword, would try what the weariness and thirst of his soldiers would avail them. He himself then made a gradual advance, such as his means and situation allowed, in the same order in which he had descended the hill. Marius was behind in command of the troops facing the enemy. He himself with the cavalry of the left wing, which in the new order of marching was become the van. End of Jugurthine War Part 5 Jugurthine War Part 6 As soon as Jugurtha marked that Metellus' rear had passed his own front ranks, he occupied the hill at the point where Metellus had descended with a force of about two thousand foot so as to prevent it serving as a refuge and subsequent stronghold to his adversaries in a retreat he then suddenly gave the signal and rushed upon the enemy some of the numidians cut down our rear ranks others assailed us on either flank everywhere the enemy was upon us and pressing us hard the roman ranks were thrown into disorder at every point and even soldiers who had resisted the enemy with unusual resolution found themselves thwarted by the baffling nature of the fight, and while they were being wounded from a distance had no means of striking a blow in return or coming to close quarters. As often as one of our squadrons began to pursue, Jugurtha's horsemen, according to their instructions, did not retreat any body or to any one place but scattered themselves as widely as possible. They were superior in numbers, 
and whenever they had failed to deter the enemy from pursuit, surrounded them on their rear and flanks when their order was broken. When again the hill offered a readier retreat than the plains, the Numidian horses, accustomed to such riding, easily made their way amid the brushwood, while ours were held back by the rough and unusual nature of the ground. The whole engagement, in its changeful and indecisive aspect, was such as to arouse both shame and pity. Separated from their comrades, some retreated, others pursued, heedless of standards and ranks, each man made his stand where danger had overtaken him, and there tried to avert it. Swords and javelins, horses and men, foes and countrymen, were mingled in confusion. No plan was followed or order obeyed. Chance was supreme over all. The fourth part of the day had passed in this way, and even yet the issue was uncertain. At last, when all were faint with toil and heat, Metellus marked that the onset of the Numidians was less vigorous, and gradually getting his men together, reformed their ranks, and posted four cohorts of legionaries to resist the enemy's infantry, of which a great part, out of sheer weariness, had seated themselves on the higher ground. At the same time he begged and exhorted his men not to show themselves wanting, nor to suffer the fleeting enemy to win the day, reminding them that they had no camp or fortifications of any kind to which to retreat, and that all their hopes lay in their arms. Meanwhile, Jugurtha, on his side, did not remain inactive. He visited and encouraged his men, renewed the battle, and backed by his chosen followers, left no means of attack untried. He relieved his own troops and pressed on the enemy when they wavered. Where he saw them making a firm stand, he hampered them by distant assaults. Thus did the two generals, both of them men of high ability, vie with each other in their efforts. Personally, they were a match, but the resources at their disposal were unequal. Metellus could count on the courage of his troops, but the ground was against him. Jugurtha, on the other hand, had everything in his favor save the quality of his men. At last the Romans understood that they had no place of escape, and that the enemy was avoiding a regular battle. When evening had already arrived, they carried out their orders and stormed the hill. The Numidians, on losing their position, fled in confusion. A few were killed, but the majority were protected by their own fleetness and by their enemies' ignorance of the country. Meanwhile, as soon as Rutilius had marched past him, Balmulsar, who, as related above, had been placed by Jugurtha in command of the elephants and a part of the infantry, slowly led his men down into the plain, and, while the Roman officer continued his hasty advance toward the river to which he had been dispatched, marshaled his army as noiselessly as the occasion demanded, and kept ceaseless watch on every movement of the enemy. Learning that Rutilius had already encamped and was quite off his guard, and at the same time that the din of the battle in which Jugurtha was engaged was increasing, he now feared lest the lieutenant should discover what was happening, and assist his hard-pressed comrades. In his distrust of his men's courage, he had drawn up his line in close order, but he now extended it so as to block the enemy's march, and in this order advanced against the camp of Rutilius. The Romans, whose view was shut off by a plantation of trees, were suddenly aware of a great cloud of dust. At first, they thought it was the dry soil being blown about by the wind. They noticed, however, that its advance was steady and like that of an army in battle order, and that it approached even nearer and nearer. At last, understanding what was really happening, they hastily seized their arms, and in obedience to order, took up a position in front of the camp, 
the distance between the two armies diminished, and they charged each other with a loud shout. The Numidians stood their ground only as long as they thought to find help in their elephants. As soon as they saw them entangled in the branches of the trees, and thus scattered and surrounded, they took to flight, and most of them, with the loss of their arms, escaped whole and sound under cover of the hill and of the night, which was now falling. Of the elephants, four were captured, the rest, to the number of forty, were killed. The Romans were tired with marching, camp-making, and fighting, and were flushed with their victory. The arrival, however, of Metellus was unexpectedly delayed, and they advanced to meet him ready for battle and on the alert, for the stratagems of the Numidians forbade any relaxation of vigilance. The night was dark, and the two armies, when now not far apart, each inspired the other with terror and confusion by its noise as if of an enemy's approach. In this state of ignorance, a pitiable disaster was on the point of happening when the horsemen who were dispatched from both armies discovered the truth. As it was, fear was suddenly exchanged for joy. The soldiers hailed each other in triumph and heard and related their several exploits. Each man was loud in praising his prowess to the skies. Thus is it in the affairs of men. In victory even the cowards may boast while calamity cast a slur even on the brave. Remaining four days in the same encampment, Metellus made the recovery of the wounded his care, rewarded those who had done good service in the battles according to military custom, and praised and thanked the whole body of his troops in a public speech. He exhorted them to maintain a like spirit in the face of the easy task which still remained and assured them that they had already fought enough for victory, and that the rest of their toils would be for booty. In the meantime, however, he sent deserters and other suitable agents to discover where Jugurtha might be living, and how he was employed. Whether he was at the head of a few followers, or of an army, and how he bore himself under a defeat. The king, I should mention, had withdrawn to a woody country of natural strength, and was there collecting an army, greater in numbers, but without vigor or strength, and composed of men more skilled in the art of the husbandman or shepherd than in that of war. The cause of this was that with the exception of the royal cavalry, no Numidian attends the king after a rout. They disperse to whatever quarter they severally feel inclined, and this is not esteemed a military offense, but is the custom of the country. Metellus saw that Jugurtha's spirit was still high, and that a war was being renewed, the conduct of which must depend on his adversary's pleasure. Between himself and his enemies the contest was unequal, for their defeats were less costly than his own victories. He determined, therefore, to carry on the war not by battles nor in battle array, but in another fashion altogether. Accordingly, he marched into the richest part of Numidia, wasted the country, captured and burnt many strongholds and towns which had either been hastily fortified or left without a garrison, slew all the adult males, and ordered everything else to be the soldier's booty. Amid the terror thus inspired, many persons were surrendered to the Romans as hostages. Corn and other useful provisions were supplied in abundance, and a garrison was stationed wherever there seemed occasion. This policy had a much greater effect in frightening the king than any battle lost by his soldiers. He, whose whole hope lay in flight, found himself obliged to pursue, and though he had been unable to protect his country when his own, he had now to wage war in it when the enemy was its master. 
he embraced the course which seemed best with the means at his disposal and ordered the greater part of his army to conceal itself in a fixed position while he himself with some picked cavalry pursued Metellus by a series of night marches along unfrequented roads he escaped notice and suddenly attacked a straggling body of Romans most of them were cut down in their defenseless condition many were captured and not one of the whole number made his escape unhurt before relief could arrive from the camp the Numidians according to their orders withdrew to the neighboring hills meanwhile at Rome great rejoicing arose on the intelligence of the doings of Metellus of his adherence to ancient custom in his government of himself and his army of the victory which though in an unfavorable position his valor had won him of his mastery of the enemy's country and of how he had reduced Jugurtha whose glory had been raised so high by the carelessness of Aulus Albinius to place his hope of safety in a retreat to the deserts. The Senate therefore decreed thanksgivings to the immortal gods for the campaign so happily conducted, and the citizens who had been alarmed and anxious as to the issue of the war regained their cheerfulness. Of Metellus men spoke in the most distinguished terms. The general now redoubled his efforts for victory and used every means of dispatch. He was cautious, however, nowhere to expose himself to the enemy and remembered that envy follows close upon reputation. The more his fame increased, the greater was his anxiety and, after Jugurtha's treacherous attacks, he no longer scattered his army on plundering expeditions. When corn or fodder were needed, certain cohorts of infantry, together with the whole of the cavalry, acted as a guard. Part of the army he led in person. The rest were under Marius, but it was rather by fire than by rapine that he wasted the country. The two generals pitched their camps at no great distance from each other. Where strength was required, they united their forces. On other occasions, they kept apart, so as to spread flight and terror the wider. At this period, Jugurtha was following them along the hills, seeking a suitable line and position for a fight. Ascertaining what was to be the root of the enemy, he would destroy the fodder as well as the springs, of which there was a scarcity, showing himself at one time to Metellus, at another time to Marius. He would attack their rear ranks and immediately retreat to the hills, to recommence his threatening demonstrations first in one quarter, then in another. He neither gave battle nor allowed the enemy rest, and contented himself with hampering them in their projects. The Roman general saw that he was being exhausted by this strategy, and that no offer of battle was made by the enemy. He determined therefore to besiege a large town named Zama, the key of that part of the kingdom in which it was situated, thinking that, as the occasion demanded, Jugurtha would come to the relief of his subjects in their strait, and that there would be a battle before the place. The king however was acquainted of this plan by deserters and by forced marches outstripped Metellus exhorted the inhabitants to defend their walls reinforced them with a contingent of deserters the troops who since they could not play in force were the most trustworthy of the royal forces and promised in addition that in due course he would himself come to their help with his army after making these arrangements, Jugurtha retired to the most secret recesses he could find. A little while afterwards, he learnt that Marius, with a few cohorts, had left the line of march on a mission to Sicca, there to collect corn. This town had been the first 
to secede from the king after his defeat. He now marched thither by night with his chosen body of horse and attacked the Romans in the gateway as they were in the act of departure. At the same time, he loudly called on the men of Sicca to surround the cohorts in the rear. Fortune, he shouted, was giving them the chance of a noble achievement. If they accomplished it, henceforth he should live in fearless enjoyment of his kingdom and they of their freedom. Marius hastened to advance and get clear of the town. Had he not done so, the whole or a great part of the people of Sicca would surely have played him false. With such fickleness do the Numidians behave. As it was, Jugurtha kept his soldiers for a short while in their ranks. As soon as the enemy began to press them harder, they scattered in flight after losing a few of their number. Marius next arrived before Zama. This town, situated on a plain, was strong rather by art than by nature, was abundantly provided with every requisite, and well supplied both with arms and men. After making such preparations as his circumstances and the nature of the ground allowed, Metellus surrounded the whole extent of the walls with his troops, and assigned to each of his officers his post of command. At a given signal, a shout rose simultaneously from every quarter, but without terrifying the Numidians, who stood their ground without confusion, hostile and on the alert. The battle then began. The Romans fought each according to his temper. Some discharged bullets and stones from a distance. Others advanced close to the wall and tried now to undermine it, and now to storm it with ladders showing great anxiety to bring the fight to close quarters. On the other side, the townsmen rolled down stones on their nearest assailants, and flung pointed stakes and javelins, and torchwood dipped in burning pitch and sulfur. Even those who had remained at a distance found but slight protection in their timidity, for many of them were wounded by javelins hurled either from engines or by the hand and thus brave and cowardly shared the same peril, though with very different renown. While this conflict was raging around Zama, Jugurtha suddenly attacked the enemy's camp with a large force, and burst upon the gate at a time when the garrison had grown careless, and were expecting anything rather than a battle. Astounded by the sudden alarm, our men consulted their safety in such ways as their several characters inclined them. Some fled, others seized their arms, while many were by this time wounded or killed. Out of all that host, however, not more than forty took thought for the honor of Rome. These formed themselves into a body, and seizing a position a little higher than the rest, defied all efforts to dislodge them hurling back the darts discharged at them from a distance, and as a few men amid a host, more rarely missing their aim. Whenever the Numidians attacked them at close quarters, they displayed prodigies of valor, and slaughtered, scattered, and routed them with the greatest vigor. Meanwhile, Metellus, as he was pressing on the siege with much energy, heard the noise of an attack in his rear. Turning his horse, he observed that the flight was toward himself, which showed the fugitives to be his own soldiers. In all haste, he dispatched the whole of his cavalry to the camp, followed immediately afterwards by the cohorts of the allies under Gaius Marius, whom, with tears in his eyes, he besought, in the name of their friendship and of the state, not to allow reproach to cleave to their victorious army, nor to permit the enemy to escape unpunished. Marius quickly carried out his orders. Jugurtha found himself entangled in the entrenchments of the camp, and seeing some of his men hurled headlong 
over their ramparts and others in their hurry blocking each other's way amid the narrow paths withdrew with a heavy loss to his strongholds. Metellus whose own operations had been unsuccessful on the arrival of night returned with his army to the camp. End of Ugarthene War Part 6「Ugarthene War」Part 7 The next day, before marching out to the attack, he ordered the whole of the cavalry to patrol before the camp, on the side by which the king had made his approach, and assigned the charge of the different gates and the neighboring points to the different tribunes. He then marched up to the town and attacked the wall as on the former day. While he was so engaged, Ugurtha suddenly dashed upon our men from an ambush. Those who had been posted nearest to his point of attack were for the moment frightened and thrown into confusion. The rest, however, quickly came to their aid. The Numidians could now have no longer stood their ground had not their infantry mingled with the horsemen made great havoc in the encounter. In reliance on these, instead of following the usual cavalry tactics, of alternate pursuit and retreat, they charged horse against horse, and entangled and confused our ranks, and thus, by the help of their light infantry, almost defeated their enemy. Meantime the conflict was raging around Zama. The struggle was fiercest at the several points where a lieutenant or tribune was in command, and no one trusted to his neighbor's valor instead of his own. The townspeople showed no less vigor. At every point there was assault and preparations to meet it. On each side, men were more eager to wound their opponents than to defend themselves. Shouts of encouragement, joy, and pain arose to heaven amid the din of arms, while darts were flying from side to side. When the enemy for a while slackened in their attack, the defenders of the war watched with eagerness the distant cavalry engagement. As Ugurtha's fortunes rose and fell, you might mark them now rejoicing and now in fear, as if they could be heard or seen by their comrades, some shouted warnings, others encouragement, while they beckoned and gesticulated and swayed their bodies, as if to avoid or hurl the darts. Marius, who was in command at this point, mocked their behavior and feigning despair purposely slackened the attack and suffered the Numidians to gaze without disturbance at the king's encounter. As soon as they were strongly engrossed in anxiety for their comrades, he suddenly assaulted the wall with the utmost violence, and his soldiers had already climbed their ladders and almost seized the battlements. When the townspeople rallied and met them with a shower of stones, fire, and other missiles, our men at first stood their ground, then, as one ladder after another was broken, and those who had stood on them dashed to the ground, the remnant, some whole and sound, but many sorely wounded, made their retreat as best they could. At last night broke off the engagement. Metellus saw that his attempt was vain. The town was not captured. Jugurtha never gave battle except in surprises or in ground of his own choosing and the summer was already past. He now retreated from Zama, and, after placing garrisons in such of the towns which had seceded to him as were sufficiently protected by their position or fortifications, led the rest of his army to its station in that part of the province which borders on Numidia. He did not, however, follow the custom of other commanders and surrender that season to repose and luxury. But since the war was little advanced by force of arms, aimed a secret attack against the king by means of his friends, and prepared to use their treachery instead of arms. The man who, as Jugurtha's greatest friend, had the greatest power of deceiving him, was Balmasar, the same who had been with him at Rome, and after giving sureties in the matter of Massiva's death, had fled to escape trial. 
To this man, Metellus now applied with many promises, and induced him, as a first step, to visit him secretly for the sake of a conference, and then pledged his word that on his surrendering, Jugurtha dead or alive, the Senate would grant him a full pardon and possession of all his goods. These offers easily won over the Numidian, who, besides his natural inclination to treachery, was alarmed lest in the event of peace being concluded with Rome, his own surrender for punishment might be one of the terms of the treaty. On the first favorable occasion, Balmosar approached Jugurtha at a moment when he was troubled and lamenting his fortunes, and advised and conjured him with tears at last to take thought for himself and his children, and the Numidian people, who had deserved so well of him. He reminded him that they had been beaten in every battle, their country wasted, many of his subjects made prisoners or killed, and the resources of his kingdom utterly impaired. The courage of his soldiers and the fervor of fortune had already been tried sufficiently often. He implored him to be on his guard lest, while he was hesitating, the Numidians should take counsel for themselves. By these and other like arguments, Balmosar incited the king to surrender, and ambassadors were dispatched to the general to announce that Jugurtha was ready to comply with his orders, and offered to surrender himself and his kingdom to his protection without any stipulation. Metellus hastily ordered all persons of senatorial rank to be summoned from their winter quarters and held an assembly of these and such other persons as he himself thought fit. According, therefore, to ancient custom, by the decree of his council, he sent through the ambassadors his commands to Jugurtha to deliver up two hundred thousand pounds of silver, all his elephants, and a large number of horses and suits of armor. These commands were complied with without delay and he now ordered that all his deserters should be brought to him in chains. The greater number were delivered to him in obedience to these orders. A few, as soon as the surrender began, had escaped to Mauritania, to King Bacchus. After being thus plundered of arms, men, and money, Jugurtha was summoned in person to Tysidium, there to await further orders. On this he began once more to waver in his resolution, and, in consciousness of his guilt, to fear the punishment he deserved. After wasting many days in hesitation, during which at one moment in disgust at his ill fortune, he thought anything preferable to war. At another he considered how great would be the fall from king to slave. He at last resumed the war. After vainly sacrificing many of his chief means of defense, at Rome the Senate, when consulted as to the disposition of the provinces, had decreed Numidia to Metellus. About the same time it happened that, as Gaius Marius was invoking the gods in sacrifice, the diviner informed him that there were portents of great and wonderful events that he should therefore carry out in reliance on the gods whatever projects he had in his mind. Let him try fortune as often as he would. The issue would always be favorable. Even before this, Marius had been tormented with a great desire for the consulship, for attaining which he was, indeed, well endowed with every qualification except that of ancient family. He was energetic, upright, of wide experience in warfare and immense courage in battle. In domestic life he was frugal, unconquered by lust and riches, and only covetous of glory. The birthplace of Marius was Arpinum, and there he spent his boyhood. As soon as he was of an age of military service, he practiced himself not in Greek oratory or in elegant accomplishments, but in campaigning, and thus amid honorable pursuits, his character quickly developed, unimpaired. On his seeking election as a military tribune, 
Few people even knew him by sight, but the fame of his exploits procured his return by every tribe. Beginning with this, he won successive magistracies, and always so conducted himself in office as to be esteemed worthy of a more important post than the one he held. Such was the quality he had shown hitherto, for afterwards his thirst for popularity worked his ruin. And yet he did not dare to stand for the consulship. Even as late as this, the commons had entrance to other magistrates, but the consulship was preserved by the nobility as the hereditary possession of their order. No self-made man was so distinguished or had performed such noble deeds as to be held worthy of that office, or other than unclean. When Marius saw that the words of the diviner pointed in the same direction as his own desires were spurring him, he asked leave of absence from Metellus in order to stand as a candidate. Metellus was eminently endowed with courage, renown, and much else that good men might desire. He had, however, that evil so common with men of rank, a scornful and haughty temper. At first, astonished by so unusual an occurrence, he expressed his surprise at Marius' project and advised him with an appearance of friendship not to enter upon so improper a course, nor to cherish thoughts above his fortunes. It was not everything, he said, that all men were free to desire. Marius ought to be content with his position and, in fine, should be careful not to demand from the Roman people a favor which they would rightly deny him. Finding that these and other arguments did not change Marius' resolution, Metellus answered him with a promise to do what he asked, as soon as the public business would allow. When, however, the request was subsequently repeated with some frequency, he is said to have remarked that Marius should be in no hurry to depart, as it would be time enough for him to stand for the consulship in the same year as his own son, a youth of about twenty, who was serving at the time in the war and sharing his father's tent. This remark, as was afterwards seen, strongly excited Marius to efforts to gain the office to which he aspired, and to enmity towards Metellus. He set to work under the influence of ambition and anger, those worst of counselors and refrained from no act or speech that might gain him popularity. He treated the soldiers whom he commanded in the winter quarters with more indulgence than before, and at the same time spread slanderous and boastful insinuations about the war among the traitors, of whom there were many at Attica, were but the half of the army, he said, entrusted to him. In a few days, he would have Jugurtha in chains. The general was purposely procrastinating war in the excessive delight which a frivolous man of regal haughtiness took in authority. These insinuations seemed to the traitors all the better grounded, inasmuch as the length of the war had impaired their fortunes, and to the eager mind no haste is sufficient. There was, moreover, in our army a Numidian named Gorda, a son of Mastanabal and grandson of Massinissa, whom Masipsa, when spent with disease and with his mental powers, thus somewhat impaired, had appointed in his will as his second heir. Gorda had requested Metellus to assign him, as a prince, a seat next to his own, and again on a subsequent occasion to grant him a squadron of Roman cavalry as a bodyguard. Both of these requests Metellus refused the seat of honor because by custom it belonged only to those whom the Roman people recognized as kings. The guard, inasmuch as it would be an insult to Roman cavalry to consign them as attendants to a Numidian. 
Marius made advances to Garda in his trouble, and encouraged him to try, with his help, to avenge himself on the general for these insults, inflating with fair speeches a mind which diseases had enfeebled, he represented to Garda that he was a king, an important person, and the grandson of Massinissa. Should Jugurtha be captured or slain, he would have immediate possession of the kingdom of Numidia, and this might quickly be brought to pass if he himself were dispatched as consul to direct the war. In this way, not only Garda, but the Roman knights, the soldiers and traders were incited, some by Marius personally, many by the hope of peace, to speak bitterly of Metellus' conduct of the war in their letters to their connections at Rome, and to ask for Marius as general. It thus came to pass that many persons sought to gain the consulship for him, with the most honorable recommendations. While, just at this period, the commons, after routing the nobility by the mammalian law, were supporting men of no birth as candidates, thus everything combined to favor Marius. In the meantime, Jugurtha, after breaking off his surrender and renewing the war, was zealously making all possible preparations, showing great activity and collecting an army. He tried by threats and by holding out rewards to gain over the cities which had deserted him, fortified his own positions, replaced by manufacture or purchase the armor, weapons, and other material which he had sacrificed in the hope of peace, attracted bodies of Roman slaves, and with his money tampered even with the Roman garrisons. In a word, he left nothing untried, no stone unturned but adopted every possible expedient. When Jugurtha had first opened negotiations for peace, at the importunate entreaty of the king, to whom at heart the inhabitants had never been disloyal, the chief citizens now formed a conspiracy. As for the common people, they, as usual, especially with Numidians, were of an inconstant temper, rebellious, and full of discord. Eager for change, the enemies of peace and quietness. Arranging their plans among themselves, they agreed to carry them out on the third day, which was one observed as a festival throughout all Africa, and promised rather sport and wantonness than alarm. When the time arrived, the centurions, military tribunes, and the governor of the town, Titus Tupilius Silanus himself, were invited by different citizens to their homes, and all, with the exception of Tupilius, massacred in the course of the banquet. The conspirators then attacked the soldiers, who were wandering about unarmed as was natural on such a day, and in the absence of their officers. The common people followed their example. Some instructed by the nobles, others urged only by the zeal for such work. These were ignorant of what had been done and the purpose of it, but found in the mere rioting and revolution enough to content them. The Roman soldiers, baffled by so unexpected an alarm and not knowing what best to do, fell into confusion. A force of the enemy barred their path to the citadel, where their standards and shields were deposited. The gates, previously closed, prevented their flight and the women and children standing on the edge of the roofs zealously hurled at them stones and such other missiles as were at hand. Against so baffling a danger no precautions could be taken, and the bravest soldiers could make no resistance to these weakest of opponents. Good and bad, stout and cowardly, were alike massacred unavenged. Amid these outrages, when the cruelty of the Numidians was at its height, and every gate shut, the governor, Tupilius, was the single Italian who escaped unharmed. Whether this was the result of his host's compassion, of a bargain, or of chance, I cannot assure myself. Inasmuch, however, as in such a calamity he preferred a shameful life to unspotted honor, he seems to have been a worthless, 
and execrable character. Metellus, on receiving news of the event at Vaga, for a short while retired in sorrow from the public gaze. As soon as anger began to mingle with his grief, he hastened with the utmost zeal to avenge the wrong. Exactly at sunset, he led out the legions with which he was in winter quarters, and as many Numidian horsemen as he could muster, lightly equipped. About the third hour of the next day, he arrived at a plain surrounded on all sides by somewhat higher ground. His soldiers, tired with their long march, were inclined to be mutinous. When Metellus laid the matter before them, told them that Vaga was not more than a mile distant, and that they ought cheerfully to submit to the rest of their toil, so long as they could avenge their fellow citizens, those bravest and most unfortunate of men. In addition, he generously promised them the booty. After thus raising their spirits, he ordered the cavalry to go in front in skirmishing order, and the infantry to follow with their ranks as close as possible, and their engines concealed. The people of Vaga, on perceiving that an army was marching in their direction, at first conjectured rightly that it was Metellus, and closed their gates. When, however, they noticed that their lands were not being wasted, and that the van was composed of Numidian cavalry, they changed their minds and thinking it was Jugurtha who was coming, went forth to meet him with great rejoicing. Suddenly, part of the cavalry and infantry at a given signal cut to pieces the crowd which had poured out of the town, while others hurried to the gates, and others seized the towers. Rage and the hope of plunder overcame their weariness. The men of Vaga rejoiced in their treachery for only two days. The whole of that great and wealthy city was now given over to vengeance and plunder. Terpilius, the governor of the town who, as explained above, was the only man who escaped the massacre, was ordered by Metellus to stand his trial. He excused his conduct but lamely was condemned and, as a Latin citizen, punished by scourging and decapitation. End of Uyghur Theme War Part 7 Uyghur Theme War Part 8 About the same time, Bamusar at whose instigation Jugurtha had begun the surrender which he afterwards abandoned through fear, having incurred the king's suspicion and being suspected by him in turn, was now desirous of a change of affairs. After wearying his mind day and night in seeking some plot to work Jugurtha's destruction, he at last, in the course of his innumerable efforts, took to himself as an accomplice a noble named Nabdausa, a man of great wealth and beloved and esteemed by his countrymen, who generally held an independent command and carried out all tasks which Jugurtha, either from weariness or from attention to weightier matters, had left unfulfilled. In this way he had acquired both renown and wealth. By agreement between the two conspirators, a day was fixed for their treachery. Everything else they thought best to arrange at the moment, as occasion might demand. Nabdalsa set out for his army, which, according to his orders, he was keeping between the outer stations of the Romans, to prevent the enemy from ravaging the country with impunity. Confounded by the greatness of the crime, he did not appear at the time agreed on, and his cowardice prevented the execution of the plot. Balmosar was eager to carry out his designs, but at the same time was disconcerted by the timidity of his accomplice. Fearful lest, now that Naldapsa had abandoned his original plan, he might form some new one, he dispatched a letter to him by trusty messengers. In this letter, after reproaching him for his lack of resolution and energy, and calling to witness the gods by whom he had sworn, 
he warned him not to turn the bribes of Metellus to his destruction, and showed that Jugurtha's ruin was near at hand, and that the only question was whether he should perish by their courage or by that of Metellus. Nabdalsa should consider, therefore, whether he preferred rewards or a miserable death. When this letter was delivered, Nabdalsa happened to be fatigued and was resting on a couch. After acquainting himself with the message of Balmosar, at first anxiety and then, as often happens, sleep took possession of his troubled spirit. In his service was a certain Numidian who took charge of his affairs, much trusted and esteemed by him, and the sharer in all but this latest of his designs. Hearing that a letter had been brought, and custom making him think that his own help and ability would be needed, this man now entered the tent, took the letter while his master slept, as it lay carelessly on a cushion above his head, read it through, and, learning the treachery intended, hastened to the king. Shortly afterwards Nabdalsa awoke, and, on failing to find the letter, understood exactly what had happened. At first he tried to overtake his betrayer, then finding the attempt fruitless, he approached Jugurtha with the object of appeasing him, declared that the treachery of his retainer had anticipated the step which he had himself determined to take, and tearfully besought him by their friendship and by the proofs which he had hitherto given of his loyalty, not to suspect him of such an enormity. Dissembling his real feelings, the king returned him a mild answer. After putting to death Balmosar and many others whom he discovered to have shared in his treachery, he seems to have stifled his anger for fear, lest the matter might give rise to a rebellion. From that time, no day or night brought peace to Jugurtha. He never trusted place, man or season, feared his countrymen no less than the enemy, pried into every corner, and was terrified at every sound. At night he rested, sometimes at one place, sometimes at another, often where it little fitted his royal dignity, and now and again, on waking from sleep, would seize his arms and raise an outcry, so tormented was he by a terror which verged on madness. On hearing from the deserters of the fate of Balmosar and the betrayal of the plot, Metellus once more made every preparation and hastened to renew the war. Marius was wearying him as to his departure and was at the same time hateful and hostile to him personally. Thinking him therefore an unsatisfactory lieutenant, he dismissed him home. At Rome, the commons, on learning the purport of the letters which had been dispatched on the subject of Metellus and Marius, have very readily believed the characters respectively assigned them. The noble birth, which had hitherto been an honor to the general now, made him unpopular, while humble descent brought his rival into favor. In each case, men's judgment was guided rather by party spirit then by the good or bad qualities of these two officers, turbulent magistrates, moreover excited the crowd, impeached Metellus at every public meeting, and exaggerated the merit of Marius. At last, the commons were so aroused that all the artisans and country people whose fortunes and credit lay only in their hands abandoned their work to attend on Marius, and thus postponed their own necessities to his dignity. The nobility were defeated, and the consulship, after many years, was entrusted to a man of no birth. Later on, the tribune of the commons, Titus Manlius Mancinius, demanded of the people whom they wished to conduct the war with Jugurtha, and in a full assembly the people ordered that Marius should have the command. I should mention that, a little before this, the Senate had decreed that Gaul should be his province, but this measure was useless. At the same time, 
Jugurtha, who had lost his friends, many of whom he had himself put to death, while of the rest, some in their terror had escaped to the Romans, others to King Bacchus, now found that it was impossible to carry on the war without lieutenants. Amid such treachery, however, on the part of his old officers, he thought it dangerous to try the loyalty of new ones, and was changeable and uncertain in his plans. Discontented with every man, measure, and counsel, he changed his route and his officers from day to day, marched now against the enemy and now into desert places, often rested his hopes in flight, and then, a moment afterwards, in arms. He doubted whether he could trust the courage or the loyalty of his countrymen the less, and thus, to whatever quarter he turned, found everything opposed to him. While he was in this state of inactivity, Metellus suddenly appeared at the head of an army, and Jugurtha equipped and marshaled the Numidians as well as time would allow, and the battle then began. In the quarter where the king was taking part in the fight, the conflict lasted some time. The rest of his troops were all driven back and routed at the first charge. The Romans captured a considerable quantity of standards and arms, but only a few prisoners, for in all their battles the Numidians, as a rule, are protected rather by their feet than their swords. By this defeat, Jugurtha was led to still deeper distrust of his fortunes. Taking with him the deserters and a part of his cavalry, he made his way to the waste and thence to Thala, a large and wealthy town where he had great treasures and where his sons were passing their boyhood amid much splendor. When Metellus discovered this movement, although he knew that between Thala and the nearest river there lay fifty miles of parched and barren desert, yet in the hope that by gaining possession of the town he might put an end to the war, he applied himself to surmount every difficulty and conquer even nature herself. He ordered all the beasts of burden to be relieved of their packs with the exception of provisions for ten days, and that only skins and other vessels suitable for holding water should be carried. He collected also from the fields as many trained oxen as he could, and on these placed vessels of every description, but mostly wooden, which he had got together from the huts of the Numidians. He then ordered the men of the neighborhood, who after the king's defeat had made submission to Metellus, to bring each of them as much water as he could, and announced the day and place for them to appear. He himself loaded his beast from the river, which, as I mentioned above, was the nearest water to the town, and thus equipped, set out for Thala. On arriving at the place where he had enjoyed the Numidians to meet him, the camp was hardly pitched and fortified when suddenly so much rain is said to have fallen from the heavens that this alone provided the army with water enough and to spare. Their supplies, too, surpassed their expectation, for the Numidians, like mostly newly submitted peoples, had exceeded the services required of them. The soldiers, however, from a religious feeling, preferred to use the rainwater, and its fall added greatly to their courage by making them think themselves under the protection of the immortal gods. On the next day, to the surprise of Jugurtha, they made their way to Thala. The inhabitants, who had deemed themselves protected by the difficulties of the country, were astounded by so great and unusual a feat. They prepared, however, for the conflict with undaunted energy, and our men did the same. The king now believed that nothing was impossible to Metellus, whose energy he had seen overcome all things arms and weapons, situations and seasons, and even nature herself, who ruled all other men. He therefore made his escape from the town by night, taking with him his children and a great part of his money. Henceforth he never abode in any place for longer than a single day or night, pretending that he was hurried away by business. 
but really from fear of treachery. This he thought he might avoid by the quickness of his movements, as such designs require leisure and a favorable occasion for their achievement. To return to Metellus, on seeing that the townspeople were ready for battle, and at the same time that the town was protected both by its works and its situation, he surrounded the walls with a rampart and ditch. He then pushed forward mantlets at the most suitable points that offered threw up a mound and by erecting towers on it protected his work and his helpers. To meet these measures the townspeople were active in their preparation. Nothing and fine on either side was left undone. At last the Romans wearied by much previous toil and by the battles they had fought on the fortieth day after their arrival gained possession of the town. And that alone all the booty had been destroyed by the deserters. These on seeing that rams were battering the wall and that their fortunes were ruined brought the gold, silver and whatever else was of highest value to the royal palace. There they laden themselves with wine and the banquet and then destroyed the booty, the house and their own lives by fire. They thus voluntarily paid the very penalty which they had feared to receive from their enemies in case of defeat. Simultaneously with the capture of Thala, deputies had come to Metellus from the town of Leptis, beseeching him to send thither a garrison and governor. According to their account a certain Hamosar, a man of good birth and intriguing disposition was eager for a change in affairs, and the commands of the magistrates and the authority of the law were powerless against him. Should Metellus delay their safety, allies of Rome as they were, would be in the greatest danger. The people of Leptis, I should mention, long before this, at the very beginning of the war, had sent to the council Bestia and subsequently to Rome itself to request friendship and alliance. On obtaining their prayer, they remained ever honest and loyal, and had strenuously carried out all the commands of Bestia, Albinius, and Metellus. The general therefore readily granted their petition, and sent to their town four cohorts of Ligurians and Gaius Annius as governor. Leptis was founded by Sidonians, who, as I learned, were exiled on account of internal dissensions, and came to these parts by sea. It is situated between the two Syrtes, whose name was given from their nature. These are two bays which lie almost on the verge of Africa, of unequal size but like character. Near land they are very deep. Elsewhere, as it chances, in some places deep, in others, when a storm is blowing full of shoals. When the sea gets high and struggles with the wind, the waves draw down mud, sand, and huge stones, and thus the appearance of these parts changes with every change of the wind. It is this power of suction from which they are called Syrtes. Intermarriage with the Numidians changed nothing more than the language of the people of Leptis. The greater part of their laws and civilization is Sidonian, and this they have the more easily retained owing to their distance from the king's government, for between them and the more populous part of Numidia lay many miles of desert. As the affairs of the people of Leptis have taken me into these regions, it seems not unbecoming to record a splendid and memorable deed of two Carthaginians, of which the mention of the country has reminded me. In the period when the Carthaginians were rulers over the greater part of Africa, Cyrene also was a great and wealthy city. The intervening country was sandy and monotonous, without river or mountain to mark the boundary of their dominions. This fact kept them in a desperate and prolonged war. Armies and fleets had often been defeated and routed on either side. 
and each had considerably impaired the other's strength. At last, in the fear lest some third power should presently attack both victors, and vanquished in their exhausted condition, they agreed in a time of truce that on an appointed day deputies should set out from either city, and the place where they met beheld the common boundary of the two peoples. Two brothers, called the Philani, were sent from Carthage and these made good speed in their journey. The progress of the Cyrenians was slower. Whether through laziness or accident, I have not clearly ascertained, for in these parts storms are as wont to delay the traveler as on the sea. Gathering as it sweeps across the flat and lifeless country, the wind tosses up the sand from the soil, and this is then blown along with tremendous force and fills the face and eyes, and hinders progress by shutting off all view. The Cyrenians saw that they were somewhat behindhand, and in their fear of being punished on their return for their failure, accused the Carthaginians of having left home before their time, tried to upset the whole proceedings, and in fact showed a determination to do anything rather than come off the worst. The Carthaginians then asked them to propose any other terms, so long as they were fair, and on this the Greeks gave them their choice of either being themselves buried alive at the point where they demanded that their country's boundary should be set, or allowing them to advance as far as they like on the same condition. The Philani approved of these terms and sacrificed their own persons and lives to the public good. Accordingly, they were buried alive. The Carthaginians dedicated altars to the brothers on the spot, and other honors were ordained to them in the city. I now return to my subject. After the loss of Thala, Jugurtha thought he had no sufficient safeguard against Metellus. He set out therefore with a few companions, and made his way through vast deserts to the Gaetulians, a wild and uncivilized tribe, at that time ignorant of the name of Rome. Of this people he collected a host, and in a short time accustomed them to keep the ranks, follow the standards, obey commands, and behave in other respects like regular soldiers. Beside this, by means of great gifts and greater promises, he prevailed on those immediately about King Bacchus to be zealous in his service, and with these to aid him approached the king and induced him to take up arms against the Romans. This task was the more easily and readily accomplished, inasmuch as Bacchus at the outset of this war has sent an embassy to Rome to ask for a treaty of friendship. The conclusion of such a treaty, which would have been most advantageous for the war then newly begun, was prevented by the blind avarice of a clique accustomed to sell every service, whether honorable or the reverse. Bacchus, moreover, had previously married a daughter of Jugurtha. Through this tie, is held of slight importance among Numidians and Mauritanians. Inasmuch as every one has as many wives as he can afford, some ten, some more, and the kings a proportionately greater number. The mind is thus distracted by numbers. No wife holds the place of a partner, but all are held equally cheap. The two kings now assembled their armies at a place they had agreed on. Pledges were then given and received, and Jugurtha roused the spirit of Bacchus by an harangue. The Romans, he said, were unjust, a fathomless greed, and the common enemy of all peoples. They had the same reason for a war with Bacchus as with himself and other races, their lust, namely for empire, which made them see an enemy in every kingdom. It was now himself who was the Roman's foe. A little before it 
had been the Carthaginians, then King Perses, and thereafter it would always be the richest victim they could find. After these and similar speeches, they determined on a march against the town of Cirta, as the place where Metellus had deposited his spoil, captives and heavy baggage. Jugurtha thought that they would either be rewarded by the capture of the town, or that should the Romans advance to its relief, a battle would be fought. In his crafty policy, the only thing for which he was eager was to lessen Bacchus's chance of peace, lest, if there should be any procrastination, he might prefer some other course to war. End of Yuga Theme War Part 8《Ugurthian War》Part 9 On learning of the alliance between the kings, the general no longer offered battle rashly, or, as after his many defeats of Ugurtha, he had been wont to in every position. He awaited the two kings in a fortified camp not far from Cirta, thinking it would be better to fight at his convenience after learning the quality of the Mauritanians, since they had joined in the war as a new enemy. Meanwhile, he was informed by dispatches from Rome that his province had been assigned to Marius, the news of whose election to the consulship he had received previously. These events affected him more than was either right or honorable. He could neither restrain his tears nor govern his tongue. Though distinguished in other accomplishments, he bore vexation in too womanish a manner. Some construed his behavior as a mark of pride others as the outcome of a noble spirit inflamed by insult. Many, again, as caused by the feeling that the victory he had practically won was being wrested from his hands. For myself, I am assured that it was rather the honor conferred upon Marius than his own wrongs which tormented him, and that he would have borne the blow more equitably if the province of which he was deprived had been assigned to any other than Marius. Burdened by this grief, and thinking it foolish to charge himself with another man's work to his own peril, Metellus sent ambassadors to Bocchus to desire him not to become an enemy to the Roman people without a cause. They were to urge that the king had, at this time, an opportunity of cementing a friendship and alliance, that this was far preferable to war, and that, despite his confidence in his resources, it was unwise to exchange the certain for the doubtful. Every war was easy to enter on, most difficult to abandon. To begin and to end it were not in the power of the same person. Even a coward might do the first. The time for the second was fixed by the victor's will. Bocchus, therefore, should take thought for himself and his kingdom, and should be careful not to involve his own prosperity in the ruined fortunes of Jugurtha. To this message the king returned a conciliatory answer, to the effect that he was desirous of peace, but pitied the misfortunes of Jugurtha. If the same opportunity were given to the latter, a treaty was assured. The general sent fresh messengers in reply to the proposals of Bocchus, who accepted some of his terms and declined others. In this manner the time passed in the frequent interchange of messages, and the war, as Metellus wished, was prolonged without activity on either side. As I narrated above, Marius, to the great delight of the commons, had been elected consul. Previously hostile to the nobility, after his appointment by the people to the province of Numidia, he attacked them with even greater vigor and spirit, railing now at individuals and now at the whole body, boasting that he had won the consulship as his spoil after their defeat, and in other ways exalting himself and annoying them. Meanwhile, he attached most importance to the necessary provision for the war, demanded that the strength of his legions should be raised, and summoned reinforcements from the tributary peoples and kings, and from the allies. He invited, moreover, all the bravest men from Latium, with most of whom he had been acquainted in the field, while a few he knew by report. His solicitations also constrained veterans who had served their time to set out under his command. The Senate, though hostile to him, did not dare to deny him on any point. 
the reinforcements it had voted with actual pleasure under the idea that military service was distasteful to the commons and that marius would either lose the requisites of war or the favor of the crowd this hope however was vain so great a desire for accompanying marius had seized men's minds everyone thought that he would be enriched with booty and return home victorious and pondered over other like ideas in his mind they had been moreover not a little excited by a speech of marius who after all his demands had been voted and his desire was now to enlist soldiers summoned a meeting of the people in order to encourage them and at the same time to indulge in his usual invective against the nobility his speech was as follows i am aware romans that the qualities which men show in their behavior after election are very different from those with which they sought your suffrages and that the energetic humble and unambitious character of their previous life is then changed for sloth and insolence my views however are very different from theirs for in proportion as the state as a whole exceeds the consulship and praetorship in importance by so much ought our diligence in its government to exceed that with which we seek these offices i am not insensible to the greatness of the burden which by your distinguished favor i have to bear to prepare for war without straining the treasury to press into service men whom one is unwilling to offend to superintend every detail at home and abroad and to do all this amid the jealousy of hostile intriguers is harder romans than can be conceived again if others commit an error their ancient family the brave deeds of their ancestors the wealth of their kinsmen and connections and troops of clients are all at hand to defend them i have to place my whole hopes in my own person i must needs protect them by my merit and integrity for i have no other help in which i can trust i understand too romans that the eyes of all men are upon me and that while inasmuch as my services advance the state fair and honest men are in my favor the nobility are seeking some point of attack i must therefore strive with greater energy both that you may not be deceived in me and that your enemies may be disappointed my life from boyhood to the present day has been such as to make me familiar with every toil and danger nor romans do i intend now that i have received my reward to abandon the course of conduct which previously to your kindness i voluntarily pursued men who in their desire for popularity have assumed the mask of virtue find it hard to restrain themselves when in power i who have passed my whole life in the most honorable pursuits now find that uprightness has passed from habit into nature you have commanded me to conduct the war with jugurtha and at this the nobility have taken deep offense consider i pray you whether it would be a change for the better were you to dispatch either on this or on any like commission some member of that ring of nobles some scion of an ancient house who could boast of the effigies of his many ancestors but of never a campaign and allow him on an affair of this importance to hurry and bustle about in his utter ignorance and take some man of the people to instruct him in his duty for i assure you it is nothing uncommon for the man to whom you have given command to look to some others for his orders i myself romans have known cases of consuls who after their election have begun to read the old chronicles and the greek manuals of warfare men these who begin at the wrong end for though the conduct of wars follows the appointment to them in the order of time in the order of nature and experience it precedes it with these proud ones romans compare me the self-made man the things of which they are wont to hear or read i have either seen or have myself performed and the knowledge which they get from books i have acquired by active service i leave it to you to consider whether deeds or maxims are the more important they despise my lack of family i their cowardice in my teeth men cast my fortune in theirs their infamous deeds for my own part i think that all men have one common nature and that it is the bravest who are the noblest if to the fathers of albinus or bestia the question could now be put whether they would prefer me or them as their descendants what other answers think you they would return than that they wish to have the best for their children again if these men are right in despising me 
let them do the same to their ancestors, whose nobility, like my own, sprang from their merit. They are jealous of the dignity conferred on me. Why are they not jealous of my energy, my integrity, yes, and of my dangers, since it is by these that I have gained it? Rotten with pride, they pass their days, as if they despise the dignities you can confer. Yet they demand them with the air of men who have lived an honorable life. Surely they are deceived who thus hope to unite the two things of all others the most oppose the pleasure, namely of sloth and the rewards of merit. Again, in their speeches before yourselves or the Senate, the greater part of their harangue is a eulogy of their ancestors, for they think by dwelling on their brave deeds to increase their own reputation. Yet the very reverse often is the result, for the nobler the life of their ancestors, the more shameful is their own sloth. Indeed, the glory of forefathers is really to their descendants as a burning light, which allows neither their good deeds nor their bad to remain unnoticed. I confess, Romans, I have nothing of this kind, but I have something which is far nobler, the power, namely, to tell of doings of my own. See, then, the unfairness of these men, the privileges which they claim for themselves in right of another's merit. They do not allow me in right of my own, and this because I have no effigies of ancestors to show, and because the nobility I have is a thing of today. Yet surely to have won nobility is better than to have received and shamed it. I am aware that my enemies, should they wish to answer, will be at no loss for an eloquent and studied reply. Now, however, that I am so favored by you, they attack me on every occasion, and I have, therefore, chosen not to remain silent lest my self-restraint should be mistaken for consciousness of guilt. For myself, indeed I say it from my heart, no speech can hurt me. Truth can speak no otherwise than favorably. Falsehood is foiled by the evidence of my life and character. They impugn, however, your policy in assigning me so high an office and so weighty a task. And so I ask you again and again to consider whether you ought really to repent it. To inspire your trust I have no statues, triumphs, or consulships, of my ancestors, to which to point. But if need be, I can show spears, a standard, medals, and other prizes soldiers earn, and scars dealt full upon my breast. These are my statues, these my title to nobility, and one which was not left me as a bequest, as in the case of my enemies, but which I won for myself by my many toils and dangers. My words have no studied grace, of that I think little. Merit needs no help to display it, though my enemies must use their tricks of rhetoric to conceal their base deeds behind a mass of words. Again, I have learnt no Greek. I was not anxious to gain a knowledge which had done nothing to help its teachers in pursuit of virtue. In the knowledge, however, which is far the most important for the state, I am a master. To strike the foe, to keep good watch, to fear nothing save disgrace, to bear heat and cold with equal patience, to make my bed on the ground, to undergo toil and hunger together. All this I know, and with this teaching I shall exhort my soldiers. Nor will I treat them with stringency, myself with indulgence, nor claim the glory and leave them the toil. To refrain from such conduct is to rule with efficiency and moderation. To live in luxury yourself, while you coerce your army by punishments, is to act the tyrant, not the general. By such conduct as I have praised, your ancestors won renown for themselves and the state. In reliance on their glory and nobility, their very opposite in character, now scorns us who emulate these men of old, and claims of you every post of honor, not for any service rendered, but simply as its due. Truly, these arrogant nobles make a deep mistake. Their ancestors left them everything that could be left wealth, pedigree, and their own glorious memory. Their merit they did not, and could not bequeath them. That alone is neither given nor received. They call me mean and unpolished, because I am no adept at tricking out a feast, keep no actor, no cook more highly paid than my bailiff. Romans, I am proud to confess such conduct. The lesson I learnt from my father and other pious men was that graces befitted a woman, toil a man, and that the good should be always richer in glory than in wealth. Arms, not ornaments, are the true honors. 
let the nobles then continue to follow the course they delight in and prize let them live and drink in the scenes of rivalry where they spent their youth there let them pass their old age the slaves of their belly and their lust and the sweat and dust and the like let them leave to us who find more joy in them than in the feast but this they will not do when they have disgraced themselves with every crime these vilest of men come to seize the prizes of the good in defiance of all justice those outrageous vices luxury and sloth are no obstacle to the men who practice them while they are the destruction of the guiltless state i have answered my enemies with a brevity which suits my own character better than such a theme as their misconduct i will now say a few words on public affairs in the first place romans be of good heart as regards numidia hitherto jugurtha has been protected by the avarice unskilfulness and arrogance of your generals and all these you have now removed in the second place you have an army there acquainted with the country but i profess more vigorous than fortunate for a great part of it has been wasted away by the corruption or rashness of your commanders i ask such of you therefore as are of military age to join your efforts with mine and protect the state let no one take alarm from the misfortunes of others or from the arrogance of generals i shall be with you in person on the march and in the field at once to consult your interests and to share your dangers i shall treat you in all respects the same as myself and with the help of the gods victory booty renowned are all ready to our hand even were they doubtful or distant it would be yet the duty of every honest man to support the state cowardice never yet gained a man immortality nor has any parent yet asked for his children that they might exist for ever they ask that they may live out their life in uprightness and honor romans i would say more could words inspire the timid with courage for the brave man i think i have said fully enough end of Ugurthine war part nine Ugurthine War Part 10 After a speech of this kind, Marius, when he saw the enthusiasm of the commons aroused, hastily loaded ships with provisions, pay, arms, and other requisites, and ordered his lieutenant, Aulus Manlius, to set out in charge of them. Meanwhile he himself levied soldiers, not, according to ancient custom, from the classes, but simply as they volunteered, and, for the most part, men of no fortune. Some asserted that this course was taken owing to the scarcity of respectable recruits. Others trace it to the consul's desire for popularity, inasmuch as it was by men of this description that his renown and dignity had been given him, while the seeker for power ever finds his readiest instrument in the needy wretch, who, in his destitution, has no home to hold dear, and thinks everything honorable that brings him gain. Marius, therefore, set out for Africa with a force slightly in excess of that decreed him, and after a few days landed at Utica. The army was delivered to him by Publius Rutilius, the lieutenant of Metellus, for the general himself had avoided the sight of Marius, lest he should see the things of which his resolution had been unable to support the mere hearing. With his legions and auxiliary cohorts at their full strength, the consul marched upon a fertile district, stocked with booty. He gave the whole of the plunder there taken to his soldiers, and then attacked some fortresses and towns which were neither well situated, nor manned for defense. He also fought many petty engagements at various points. Meanwhile, his raw soldiers joined in battle without alarm, and saw that the runaways were either captured or killed, that the bravest man was the safest, and that the power of protecting his freedom, country, parents, and every other blessing, and of winning glory and wealth, all lay in a man's arms. In this way, recruits and veterans were soon welded together, and all became equally courageous. On learning of the arrival of Marius, the kings separated, and made their way to inaccessible districts. Jugurtha had determined on this course in the hope that it might be possible to attack the enemy in detail, and that the Romans, like most other soldiers, when relieved of alarm, would grow careless and disorderly. Meanwhile, Metellus had started for Rome and was there, contrary to his expectation, 
received with the utmost rejoicing. Now that his unpopularity had faded away, he was equally beloved by the commons and the senate. Marius now gave his mind with energy and foresight to the position alike of his own and the enemy's army, ascertained that their respective advantages and drawbacks, set spies to watch the movements of the kings, forestalled their plans and treacheries, and left nothing unlocked on his own side, or unmenaced on theirs. He had thus often attacked and routed on their march both the Galutians and Jugurtha, as they tried to plunder our allies, and, not far from Cerda, had stripped the king himself of his arms. Finding, however, that these exploits served rather to gain glory than to finish the war, he determined to invest, one after another, the cities which from their garrison or situation were most adapted for helping the enemy and injuring himself. Jugurtha would thus be deprived of his strongholds should he not interfere, or, if he did, would have to fight a battle. As for Bocchus, that king had sent numerous embassies to him, expressing his desire for the friendship of the Roman people, and assuring him that he need fear no attack from his quarter. Whether in this he was feigning in order to make an assault the more dangerous because unexpected, or whether it was an outcome of the fickle character which made him love to be now at peace, and now at war, has not been ascertained. The consul carried out his plans, and by marching on the fortified towns and strongholds, wrested them from the enemy, in some cases by force, in others by threats or promise of reward. At first he confined himself to insignificant ventures, thinking that Jugurtha would give battle in defense of his subjects. When he learned that the king was far away and engaged on other business, it seemed time to attempt greater and more difficult undertakings. In the midst of vast deserts there lay a strong and important town, Namcapsa, founded, so tradition said, by the Libyan Hercules. Jugurtha had exempted its citizens from tribute, his yoke was light, and they were, therefore, the most loyal of his subjects. Against their enemies they were protected by walls, arms, and men, and above all, by their inaccessible position. With the exception of the immediate neighborhood, the whole country was desolate, untilled, without streams, and made unsafe by serpents, which, like all savage creatures, become more dangerous by lack of food, while their nature, of itself a deadly one, is more quickened by thirst than by anything else. A great desire of mastering this place had seized Marius. It would be useful for the war, and at the same time the exploit appeared difficult, and Metellus, with great glory to himself, had taken the town of Thala, whose position and fortifications were very like those of Capsa, except that at Thala there were some springs not far from the walls, while the people of Capsa had only a single fount of running water, and that within the town. The rest of their supply came from rain. This inconvenience, both at Capsa and in all parts of Africa where men lived amid deserts far from the sea, was the more easily borne owing to the Numidian habit of feeding chiefly on milk and game, while they avoid salt and other stimulants of the palate. Food is to them the antidote of hunger and thirst, not an object of passionate extravagance. To resume, the consul made every inquiry, and then, I suppose, placed his trust in heaven, for no forethought could enable him to make sufficient provision against such obstacles. Besides those I have mentioned, he was assailed by a scarcity of corn, for the Numidians applied themselves more to raising fodder for their cattle than crops, and by command of the king had conveyed every blade to their strongholds. It was now also the height of summer, and the country at this season was parched and barren. In spite of these difficulties, Marius made such arrangements as his means allowed with great forethought. He assigned to the auxiliary cavalry the task of conveying all the cattle that had been captured on the previous days, ordered his lieutenant, Aulus Manlius, with some light cohorts, to proceed to the town of Laris, where he had stored pay and provisions, and announced that in a few days he would come to the same place in person in the course of his pillaging. With his real object thus concealed, he advanced towards the river Teneus. On his march he had each day equally proportioned out the flocks among his army by sentries and squadrons, and saw that leather bottles were made out of the hides. In this way he lessened the effects of the scarcity of corn, and at the same time, in perfect secrecy, made preparations, 
soon to be of use, while finally by the sixth day, when they reached the river, a great quantity of skins had been got ready. Marius now pitched his camp with only a slight fortification, and ordered the soldiers to take their food and be prepared to march exactly at sunset. All their baggage was to be thrown away, and they were to load themselves and their beasts with nothing but water. When it seemed time, he marched out of the camp, advanced throughout the night, and then came to a halt. He followed the same plan the next night, and on the third arrived, long before dawn, at some downs, distant not more than two miles from Capsa. There he concealed himself and all his forces as closely as he could. Day dawned, and the Numidians, who dreaded no attack, issued in numbers from the town, when suddenly Marius ordered all his cavalry and the swiftest of his foot soldiers to advance at full speed upon Capsa, and seize the gates. He himself hurried eagerly after them, and forbade the soldiers to go after booty. The townspeople became aware of his attack and the peril of their position. Their great alarm, the suddenness of the calamity, and the fact that a part of their citizens were outside the walls and in the enemy's power, all compelled them to surrender. The town was nevertheless burnt, the adult Numidians slaughtered, all the others sold, and the spoil divided among the soldiers. This outrage on the laws of war was not caused by any avarice or wickedness on the part of the consul. It was due to the fact that the place, while useful to Jugurtha, was difficult for us to reach, and its inhabitants a fickle and treacherous race, restrained neither by kindness nor fear. Even before this Marius had been regarded as a great and illustrious general. Now that he had accomplished such an exploit without loss to his soldiers, his fame rose still higher. Every error in his judgment was interpreted as a merit. The soldiers, who were mildly governed and at the same time enriched, praised him to the skies. The Numidians feared him as something more than man, and in fine all, allies and enemies alike, believed that he was either inspired or that, by the will of heaven, all things were foretold him. After the success of this undertaking, the consul marched upon other towns, captured by storm a few where the Numidians resisted, but found a greater number abandoned owing to the terror inspired by the fate of Capsa. These he destroyed with fire and filled the whole land with sorrow and bloodshed. After gaining possession of many places, and mostly without loss to his army, he applied himself to another exploit, not indeed so perilous as that of Capsa, but no less difficult to achieve. Not far from the river Muluka, which separated the kingdom of Jugurtha and Bocchus, there rose amid the surrounding plain a rocky mountain, broad enough at the summit for a fort of moderate size, and reaching to an immense height. A single narrow approach was left. All the rest was as precipitous naturally as if labor and design had been employed to form it. The fact that the king's treasures were stored in this place now led Marius to concentrate all his energies on its capture. Chance, however, was more instrumental than skill in bringing about a happy result. The fort was well supplied with men and arms, and had an abundance of provisions and a spring of water. The ground, too, was unsuited for the employment of ramparts, turrets, and other means of attack. And the path used by the garrison was extremely narrow, with the sheer descent on either side. Penthouses were brought up at great risk, but with no result. As soon as they had made a slight advance, they were destroyed by fire or showers of stones. The ruggedness of the ground prevented soldiers from making a stand in front of their works, and they could not even labor amid the penthouses without danger. The bravest men were wounded or killed, and their loss increased the terror of the rest. After many days had been spent in fruitless toil, Marius anxiously debated whether he should abandon the attempt, since all his efforts were in vain, or wait for the fortune whose favors he had often experienced. He had pondered his situation for many restless days and nights, when a certain Ligurian, a private in one of the auxiliary cohorts, happening to leave the camp to fetch water, at a point not far from the side of the fort, opposite to that on which the combatants were engaged, noticed some snails crawling amid the rocks, and, as he went after the first one, then another, then a large number, in his eager gathering gradually climbed nearly to the summit. He at last remarked the loneliness of his situation, and man's inborn love of the difficult made him change his purpose. 
it happened that just where he was a large home oak had sprung up amid the rocks growing for a little way horizontally and then taking a turn and springing aloft in the natural direction of all plants clinging sometimes to the branches of this tree at others to the jutting rocks the ligurian made his way to the level summit of the mountain for the attention of all the numidians was occupied with the combatants after satisfying himself on all points which he thought might presently be of use he now returned by the same way not however carelessly as he had ascended but testing and examining every inch he then hastily sought an interview with marius informed him of his adventure and advised him to assail the fort on the side by which he had made the ascent offering himself to act as guide on the perilous journey marius sent some of those about him with the ligurian to test his assurances and these according to several characters variously reported the undertaking as difficult or easy the spirit however of the consul was somewhat raised from the trumpeters and the horn-blowers at his disposal he chose five of the swiftest and sent with them four centurions as a guard he ordered the whole force to obey the ligurian and fix the following day for the attempt when he saw that the appointed time had arrived and all the arrangements were complete marius advanced against the place meanwhile the scaling party instructed by their leader had changed their armor and accoutrements and had bared their heads and feet so as more easily to see and keep their footing amid the rocks on their backs they carried their swords and shields but these last were of numidian make and formed of leather both as being lighter and making less noise when struck the ligurian led the way and fastened nooses around the rocks and the projecting roots of ancient trees so as by these supports to assist the soldiers in their ascent some were frightened by the strange nature of the track and these from time to time he helped along with his hands whenever the ascent was somewhat steeper he sent them on in front one by one without their arms and then followed with these himself where the footing seemed doubtful he was the first to test it and by repeatedly climbing up and down in the same way and then suddenly standing aside inspired the rest with boldness after a long and exhausting climb they at length arrived at the fort and found it undefended on this side its garrison as on other days had all gone to face the enemy on hearing from the messengers of the success of the ligurian marius although he had kept the numidians fully engaged in battle the whole of the day now redoubled his exhortations to his soldiers and himself issuing beyond the penthouses made his men advance under cover of their locked shields and at the same time terrified the enemy from a distance by means of his catapults bowmen and slingers the numidians on previous occasions had often overthrown or burnt the roman penthouses and were no longer in the habit of sheltering themselves behind their ramparts alike by day and night they moved to and fro before their wall insulted the romans scoffed at marius as a madman threatened our soldiers with being made slaves to jugurtha and displayed all the insolence of success meanwhile when all both romans and numidians were occupied in the battle and our men were fighting vigorously for fame and dominion the others for their own safety the trumpets suddenly sounded in the rear the women and boys who had issued forth to see the fight were the first to fly and they were followed by those of the defenders nearest the wall and finally by the whole body of armed and unarmed men on this the romans redoubled their efforts scattered the enemy whom for the most part they were content only to wound made their way over the bodies of the slain strove in their eagerness for glory each to be the first to reach the wall and in not a single instance allowed plunder to delay them marius's rashness was redeemed by his fortune and his fault redounded to his fame end of Ugurthine war part ten Ugurthine War, Part 11 While this affair was in progress, the quaestor, Lucius Sulla, entered the camp with a large force of cavalry, which he had been left behind at Rome to levy from Latium and the Allies. Our subject thus brings this remarkable man to our notice, and it, therefore, seems fitting briefly to describe his character and accomplishments, as we shall have no other opportunity of speaking on Sulla, and Lucius Cicena, who has composed the best and most painstaking treatise of any writer on this subject, seems to me hardly to have spoken his mind with freedom. 
Sulla, then, was nobly born, of a patrician house and a family which the indolence of his ancestors had reduced to obscurity. He was well versed in the literatures of Greece and Rome as the most learned, a man of great aspiration, eager for pleasure, yet more eager for fame, luxurious in his leisure, yet never suffering pleasure to withdraw him from his duties, except that he might have better consulted his honor in his married life. He was eloquent, shrewd, and an obliging friend, with quite incredible skill in feigning and concealment, and of great generosity in many matters, especially with regard to money. Before his triumph in the Civil War, though the most fortunate of men, his luck never surpassed his energy, and many doubted whether he could more rightly be called the fortunate or the brave. As to his subsequent conduct, I do not know whether its narration would be a more shameful or a more disgusting task. When, as narrated above, he arrived with the cavalry in Marius's camp in Africa, Sulla was quite ignorant and unpracticed in war. In a short time, however, he became the most skillful soldier in the army. He addressed the men with kindness, granted many favors, both by request and of his own accord, and was unwilling to receive those offered by others, though he returned these more readily than he did his loans. For his own part, he never sought repayment, but rather was anxious to increase the number of his debtors. He would talk, both gravely and gaily, with the humblest, frequently visited the men at their work, on the march and on guard, and all the time refrained from the vice of the meanly ambitious, and never injured the character of the consul or any man of honor. He contented himself with allowing none to excel him in the counsel or action, and with himself outstripped most competitors. By these services and accomplishments he quickly endeared himself to Marius and the soldiers. Jugurtha had lost the town of Capsa, and many other fortified important places, and with them great treasures. He now sent messengers to Bacchus, bidding him lead his forces into Numidia with all speed, as the time for battle had arrived. Learning that the king was hesitating, and pondering in doubt on the respective advantages of peace and war, he again, as he had done before, bribed those about him, while to the Mauritania himself he promised a third part of Numidia, to be surrendered on the expulsion of the Romans from Africa, or the conclusion of a peace, which should leave his dominions intact. Bacchus was enticed by the bribe, and joined Jugurtha with a great host. The two kings united their armies, and attacked Marius, who was already setting out for his winter quarter, when hardly a tenth part of the day was left, thinking that the night, which was already falling, would protect them if worsted, while, if victorious, their knowledge of the country would prevent its hampering them. The Romans, on the other hand, they thought, would, in either event, find their difficulties increased in the darkness. The consul had no sooner been warned from many quarters of the approach of the enemy than the enemy himself was upon him, and before the army could be marshaled or collect its baggage, indeed, before it could receive any signal or command, the Mauritanian and Gaetulian cavalry, in no line or order of battle, but in troops, just as chance had thrown them together, charged down upon our men. These were confused with the suddenness of the alarm, but nevertheless each remembered his courage, and either seized on his armor, or sheltered from the enemy others so engaged. Some mounted their horses and advanced against the enemy, and the fight assumed the character rather of a contest with brigands than a battle. Foot and horse were mingled together without standards or ranks, slaughtering others and being themselves cut down. Many who were fighting desperately against the foe in front found themselves beset in the rear. Neither valor nor armor gave any real security. Our men were outnumbered by their enemy and surrounded on every side. At last, the Romans, whose knowledge as a body of war was increased by the present mixture of veterans and recruits, formed in rings as chance or the nature of the ground threw them together, and being in this way sheltered and in good order on every side, beat off the enemy's attack. Though beset by such a calamity, Marius was neither downcast nor inclined to despond. At the head of his own troop, which he formed of brave soldiers rather than of personal friends, he ranged over the field, at one moment helped some hard-pressed Romans, at the next charged into the thickest of his foe. He thought for his soldiers he showed by his valor, for in the general confusion he could give them no commands. 
The day was now spent, and the barbarians relaxed no effort, but rather pressed on more vigorously, believing, as the kings had told them, that the night was in their favor. At this point Marius took the best course the situation allowed, and in order to provide his men with a refuge, seized on two neighboring hills, the one of which, though too small for a camp, possessed a bountiful spring of water, while the other was suited to his purpose, being for the most part lofty and steep, and thus requiring little entrenching. Ordering Sulla to bivouac near the spring with his cavalry, he himself gradually concentrated his scattered troops, whose confusion was fully equaled by that of the enemy, and led the whole force at a rapid pace to the hill. The difficult nature of the ground compelled the kings to desist from the battle. They did not, however, permit their men to retire at any distance, but encamped in loose order with their hosts surrounding the two hills. The barbarians then lit numerous fires, and throughout the greater part of the night rejoiced, according to their custom, with vaunts and shouts. Even their leaders grew insolent and behaved themselves as conquerors, merely because they had not fled. The Romans, who were themselves in darkness and on higher ground, could easily watch their behavior, and were greatly cheered by it. Marius, most of all, was encouraged by the inexperience the enemy betrayed, and ordered perfect silence to be kept, forbidding even the ordinary calls to be sounded at the different watches. As daylight approached, and the enemy, already wearied out, had been now for some little while overpowered by sleep, he suddenly ordered the watches, and with them the trumpeters of the cohorts, squadrons, and legions, all simultaneously to sound an alarm, and the soldiers to raise a shout and sally forth from the gates. The Mauritanians and Gaetulians, suddenly roused by unfamiliar and terrifying din, could neither flee nor seize their arms, nor in fact take any action or measures for defense. To such an extent had the din and outcry, the absence of help, and the onset of our men, the confusion and panic, caused them all to be seized as with a kind of madness. To conclude, the whole army fled in utter rout. Many arms and ensigns of war were captured, and more of the enemy were killed in this battle than in all those that preceded it. Sleep, in an unwanted panic, hampered their flight. Marius now resumed his march to his quarters for the winter, which he had determined to pass in the seaports for the sake of provisions. His victory made him neither remiss nor arrogant, and, as if in the presence of the enemy, he marched with his army in a hollow square. Sulla, with the cavalry, was on the extreme right. On the left was Aulus Manlius, with the slingers and bowmen, in charge also of the Ligurian cohorts. Tribunes, with companies of light troops, were posted in the van and rear, while deserters, the men least valued and best acquainted with the country, spied out the enemy's line of march. At the same time the consul looked to every point himself, as if none other had charge of it, visited all the men, and distributed praise and blame as they severally deserved. He compelled the soldiers to be armed and on the alert like himself, fortified the camp with the same care he displayed on the march, drafted cohorts from the different legions to keep guard at the gates, and cavalry from the auxiliary forces to patrol before the camp, posted other troops on the rampart. The watches he went round of in person, not so much from any mistrust as to the fulfillment of his orders, as from the desire to increase the willingness of his soldiers by showing them that their general shared equally in their toil. In fact, both at this and at other periods of the Jugurthine War, Marius maintained discipline, rather by appealing to his men's sense of honor than by punishments. This conduct many traced to his desire for popularity, while some thought that he had been, from boyhood, so inured to hardship and other miseries, as they were mostly accounted, that he now regarded them as pleasures. Be this as it may, the public interest was well and honorably served, as under the most tyrannical of commanders. At last, on the fourth day, not far from Serta, the scouts from all quarters presented themselves in haste, a certain sign that the enemy was at hand. Pouring in as they did from every side, and with all the same intelligence, they rendered it impossible for the consul to decide how to draw up his army for the battle. He therefore made no change in his formation, but stood his ground prepared for all emergencies. He thus balked Jugurtha, who had divided his forces into four, under the idea that one or other of them must in any case take the enemy in the rear. Meanwhile, Sulla, who was the first to be attacked, 
cheered on his men, and at the head of the troop, formed in the closest order, he charged the enemy in person. While the rest of his troops kept their position, sheltering themselves from the javelins darted from a distance, and cutting down any of the enemy who attacked them at closer quarters. While the cavalry was thus engaged, Bacchus, with the infantry whom his son Volux had brought up, and who, owing to delay in the march, had been absent from the former battle, charged his Roman rear. Marius at this moment was occupied in the front, as there Jugurtha was attacking with the strongest division. The Numidia now learnt that Bacchus had arrived, and with a few attendants wheeled round, unnoticed to the infantry. There he shouted in Latin, a tongue which he had learned to speak at Numantia, that our soldiers were fighting in vain, as a moment before he had slain Marius with his own hand, at the same time displaying a dripping sword, which in the course of battle he had stained gallantly enough with the blood of our infantry. On hearing his words our men were panic-stricken, though rather by the hideousness of such a calamity than from belief in the news. The barbarians at once plucked up their courage, and pressed the frightened Romans more fiercely. They had nearly reduced them to flight, when Sulla returned from crushing the enemy against whom he had ridden, and charged the Mauritanians on their flank. Balkis rode off immediately, but Jugurtha, in his eagerness to uphold his men, and to cling to the victory he had so nearly won, was hemmed in by the cavalry, and when all, both to his right and left, had been cut down, eluded the enemy's javelins, and broke alone through their mists. Meanwhile Marius, after routing the cavalry, hastened to the assistance of his comrades, of whose straits he had just been informed. This completed the rout of the enemy. A dreadful scene then ensued in the open plains. There was flight and pursuit, and slaughter and capture. Horses and riders dashed to the earth, and many a wounded man, with no strength to fly, or patience to lie still, struggling to rise, and forthwith fainting back. As far as the eye could reach, the whole country was strewn with weapons, armor, and corpses, and between them appeared the blood-stained earth. Henceforth, indisputably victorious, the consul. The consul now made his way to Serta, whither from the outset he had directed his march. To this place, five days after the second defeat of the barbarians, came ambassadors from Bacchus, entreating Marius in the king's name to send him two trusty envoys, as he wished to confer with both of them on his own position and on the interests of the Roman people. Marius immediately ordered Lucius Sulla and Aulus Manlius to proceed to the king, and they, although they had come by request, nevertheless determined to address the king in order to alter his disposition if hostile, or if they found him desirous of peace, to further kindle his eagerness. Accordingly, Sulla, to whose eloquence, not to his years, Manlius gave way, spoke briefly to the following effect. We greatly rejoice, King Bacchus, that heaven has warned a man of your parts at least to prefer peace to war, and by avoiding the pollution of your own nobility by association with the utter vileness of Jugurtha, to release us from the cruel necessity of bringing your mistake and his wickedness to a common punishment. From the very beginning of their empire, the Roman people has thought it better to seek friends than slaves, and has deemed it safer to rule by good will rather than compulsion. To yourself, nothing can be more convenient than our friendship. In the first place, our distance from you will make collusions almost impossible, while our good will will be as effectual as were we your neighbors. In the second, we have subjects in abundance. Of friends, neither we nor any that have ever lived have had enough. Would that you have seen the wisdom of this course from the beginning. Had you done so, you would by this time assuredly have received more favors from the Roman people than, as it is, you have suffered ills. Fortune, however, is ruler over all, and she, it seems, has seen fit that you should experience both our power and our good will. Now, therefore, that you have her permission, hasten and advance on the road you have entered. You have in your power many means of outweighing your errors by your services. Let this thought sink into your breast, that the Roman people was never outdone in a contest of kindness. Its power in real war you have learnt for yourself. To this speech, Bacchus made a peaceful and courteous reply, 
and at the same time touched briefly on his offense. He had taken up arms, he said, in no hostile spirit, but for the defense of his kingdom, a part of Numidia, whence, as he contended, he had forcibly expelled Jugurtha, had, according to the laws of war, become his own, and it was impossible for him to allow Marius to lay it waste. He alluded also to the refusal of alliance when he had previously sent an ambassador to Rome, but expressed a wish to bury the past, and, for the present, if he had Marius's permission, to send an ambassador to the Senate. Leave was granted, but Jugurtha had learnt of the embassy of Sulla and Manlius, and, fearing the very projects which were actually on foot, had bribed the friends of Bacchus, and these now led the barbarian to alter his resolve. End of Jugurthian War, Part 11« Jugurthian War, Part 12 » Meanwhile, Marius, after settling his army in huts for the winter, marched with the light cohorts and a part of the cavalry to the desert country to besiege one of the royal forts, in which Jugurtha had placed the whole of his deserters as a garrison. Bacchus, now once more, either from considering what had been the issue to him of the two battles, or by the advice of other friends whom Jugurtha had left unbribed, chose from among his intimates five of proved loyalty and great ability, and bade these proceed as ambassadors to Marius, and subsequently, if advisable, to Rome, giving them full power of treating and of concluding the war in any way they could. The ambassadors set out betimes for the Roman winter quarters, but on their way were beset and plundered by Gaetulian brigands, and escaped trembling and in sorry plight to Sulla, whom the consul, on setting out for his expedition, had left in command as pro praetor. Sulla received them not, as their condition warranted, as impostors and enemies, but with an elaborate and unstinted courtesy, which made the barbarians believe that the reputation of the Romans for avarice was undeserved, and that Sulla, since he showed them such generosity, was their friend. Even as late as this, many still understood nothing about bribery, and thought that no one was generous except out of a corresponding goodwill and regarded all gifts as tokens of kindness. The ambassadors explained to the quaestor the instructions they had received from Bacchus, and at the same time begged of him his patronage and advice, magnified the king's resources, loyalty and greatness, and touched on other points which they thought likely to be of use or to conciliate. Sulla promised them everything, and instructed by them how to address both Marius and the Senate. They remained where they were for about forty days. On returning to Serta, unsuccessfully from his enterprise, Marius was informed of the arrival of the ambassadors, and ordered them to accompany Sulla to Utica. He also summoned Lucius Belinius, a praetor, and all persons in the country of senatorial rank, and in the presence of these received the message of Bacchus. The consul granted the ambassadors leave to proceed to Rome. Meanwhile they asked for a truce, this Sulla and the majority of the council were in favor of granting. A few voted for a more arrogant course, ignorant, we may presume, of human fortunes, which in their unstable and fluctuating nature are ever shifting to opposite poles. After obtaining all their requests, three of the Mauritanians set out for Rome with Nius Octavius Russo, who, as quaestor, had brought pay money to Africa. The other two returned to the king, from these Bacchus heard with pleasure all their news, and especially of the kindness and zeal of Sulla in his service. At Rome his ambassadors, after owning that the king had erred and been led astray by the wickedness of Jugurtha, entreated for an alliance of friendship, and received as answer that, The Senate and people of Rome are wont to remember services both good and ill. To Bacchus, in so much as he repents, they accord pardon for his fault. An alliance of friendship will be granted when he has deserved it. Immediately on learning this answer, Bacchus besought Marius by letter to send Sulla to him, that under his guidance measures may be taken to settle the points at issue. Sulla was now dispatched with an escort of cavalry, foot soldiers, and Balearic slingers, and with these there went a force of bowmen and a cohort of Pelagians, who, for the sake of expedition, wore the armor of skirmishers 
by which they were as well protected as by any other kind against the light weapons of their enemies. When they had now been five days on the march, Volux, the son of Bacchus, suddenly appeared on the open plain, and not with more than a thousand horsemen. But these, by their confused and disorderly advanced, seemed both to Scylla and everybody else more numerous than they really were, and inspired a fear of hostilities. Each man, therefore, held himself in readiness, tested his armor, and prepared his weapons for use. Some little fear was felt, but hope prevailed, as was natural with conquerors when confronted with an enemy they had often defeated. Meanwhile, the horsemen who had been sent to the front to reconnoiter reported, and truly, that the encounter was a peaceful one. Volux approached, and addressing the quaestor, informed him that he had been sent by his father Bacchus, at once to meet and escort him. During this and the following day, the two forces mingled fearlessly together. But later on, when the camp had been pitched, and it was now evening, the Mauritanians suddenly hastened to Scylla, with an agitated and frightened countenance, and announcing that he was informed by the scouts that Jugurtha was not far distant, prayed and entreated him to escape secretly with himself under cover of night. Scylla haughtily replied that he had no fear of the oft-defeated Numidian, and had full confidence in his men's courage. Even, he added, were certain destruction imminent, he would rather stand his ground than betray his soldiers, and disgrace himself by flight, in order to prolong the uncertainty of a life which soon, perchance, disease might terminate. Advised, however, by Volux to set out by night, he approved the plan, and immediately ordered that when the soldiers should have finished their suppers in camp, a number of fires be lighted, and the departure effected in silence in the course of the first watch. Exactly at sunrise, when all were tired with their night march, and Sulla was measuring out a camp, the Mauritanian cavalry reported that Jugurtha was encamped in advance of them at a distance of about two miles. The news became known, and now indeed our men were seized with terror, believing themselves betrayed by Volux and beset by an ambush, nor were there wanting some who demanded that he should be summarily punished, and that so great a crime on his part should not be left unavenged. Sulla, however, although he took the same view of the case, defended the Mauritanian from harm. He exhorted his soldiers to keep a brave heart, and told them that a few men of energy had often fought with success against a host, that the less they spared themselves in the battle, the safer they would be, and that no soldier who had armed his hand ought to seek for safety from his unarmed feet. While, in the height of his terror, he exposed the blind and undefended side of his body to the foe. He then, after loudly invoking heaven to witness the crime and treachery of Bacchus, ordered Volux, since he was found plotting against them, to leave the camp. Volux besought him with tears not to hold such a belief. No deceit, he assured him, had been used. The catastrophe had been brought about by the cunning of Jugurtha, whose spies had apparently acquainted him with their route. The king, however, he continued, had no large force at his disposal. He was dependent for all his hopes and resources on his father, Bacchus, and, he believed, would not venture on any open attack in the presence of the latter's own son. The best course, it seemed to him, that they could take was to march openly through the midst of Jugurtha's camp, that he would either send his Mauritanians on front, or leave them where they were, and himself accompany Sulla without an escort. Under such circumstances his proposal was approved, and a start was at once made. Their approach was unexpected. Jugurtha waited and hesitated, and meanwhile they passed him in safety. A few days afterwards they reached their journey's end. On their arrival they found in frequent and familiar intercourse with Bacchus, a certain Numidian named Aspar, whom Jugurtha, on hearing of the summons to Sulla, had dispatched as an ambassador and secret spy upon the designs of Bacchus. They found also a certain Dabar, a son of Masugrada, and of the family of Masinissa, but of low birth on his mother's side, she having been his father's concubine, whose many good qualities had made him beloved and esteemed by the Mauritanian. Bacchus had proved this Dabar's loyalty to the Romans on many occasions, and therefore chose him to convey a message to Sulla, announcing that he was ready to do whatever the Roman people wished. He further asked the general himself to fix a day, place, and hour for a conference, and assured him that he had violated no single detail of their agreement, 
and that he need have no fear of Jugurtha's ambassador, who had been received solely to enable them to conduct their business with greater freedom, for this was the only way by which they could guard against the king's subtle attacks. I gather, however, that Bacchus was actuated rather by considerations of Punic honor than by these which he professed, and was at the same time amusing both the Romans and the Numidians with the hopes of peace. He deliberated often and deeply whether he should deliver Jugurtha to the Romans, or Sulla to him, and while his inclination was hostile, his fears pleaded our cause. Sulla replied to his message that he would speak briefly with him in the presence of Aspar, and hold the rest of their discussions in private, or with as few witnesses as possible. At the same time he instructed him what answer to return. The meeting took place in the way he wished, and Sulla announced that he had come on a mission from the consul to ask whether Bacchus intended to maintain peace or war. On this the king, according to his instructions, bade him return after ten days. He had not even yet come to any resolution, but would give him an answer on the day named. They then separated, and returned each to his own camp. When the night was far advanced, Sulla was secretly summoned by Bacchus. Only trusted interpreters were admitted by either party, and besides these, Dabar, a man of high character, and liked by both parties, as a go-between. The king immediately began the following speech. I have never thought that it could happen that I, the greatest king in this land, and of all princes of whom I know, should owe gratitude to any private person. Indeed, Sulla, I profess that before I knew you, though I helped many at their prayer, and others of my own accord, I myself needed the assistance of none. At the breach of such a custom, others are wont to grieve. To me, it is a pleasure. I am content that it may be my lot to have needed for a moment this friendship of yours, than which my heart holds nothing dearer. In this profession it is open to you to test. Take and use my arms, men, money, whatever in fact you will, and never while you live think that my debt of gratitude to you is discharged. It will ever remain with me undiminished, and, in a word, you shall never, to my knowledge, wish for anything in vain. To my thinking, it is less dishonorable for a king to be surpassed in arms than in generosity. As for your commonwealth, as a guardian of whose interest you have been sent hither, listen to the few words I have to say. I neither made war upon the Roman people, nor did I ever wish it to be made. I only used arms to protect my territory against an armed invader. This question, however, since you wish it, I pass over. As for your war with Jugurtha, carry it on as long as you please. I, for my part, will not cross the river Muluka, the ancient boundary of my kingdom, and that of Mekipsa, nor will I allow Jugurtha to come on this side of it. Furthermore, if you make any request which you can worthily prefer, and I accord, you shall not leave my presence unsatisfied. To this speech Sulla replied briefly and moderately as touching himself, but spoke at length on the subject of the peace and their common interests. As the upshot, he made it clear to the king that the senate and people of Rome, insomuch as they had proved their superiority in arms, would not regard his promises as any favor, that he must do something which they might see had been to their advantage rather than his own and that this was perfectly easy for him since he had Jugurtha in his power. Let him deliver Jugurtha to the Romans, and their debt would be great. Their friendship and alliance, and the part of Numidia which he was at present trying to obtain, would all come to him as a matter of course. The king at first gave a firm denial, alleging that the bonds of kinship and marriage, besides a solemn treaty, prevented his compliance. He had fears too, he said, lest if he should act treacherously, he might alienate the affection of his people, who loved Jugurtha and hated the Romans. At last, after many importunities, he gave way, and promised to do everything as Sulla desired. They made such arrangements as seemed expedient for counterfeiting the peace, for which the Numidian, in his weariness of war, was most desirous, and then, after concerting their plot, departed their several ways. On the next day, Bacchus summoned Aspar, Jugurtha's ambassador, and informed him that through Dabar he had learnt from Sulla that the war could be brought to an end on certain conditions, and that he therefore wished him to ascertain the views of the king. 
Aspar was overjoyed and set out for the camp of Jugurtha. When he had been duly instructed on all points by that king, after eight days he returned in haste to Bacchus, and informed him that Jugurtha was anxious to comply with every demand, but had little faith in Marius, as he had often made previously fruitless treaties of peace with Roman generals. If Bacchus wished to act in the interest of both, and gain a secure peace, he could contrive a meeting of all the parties, as if for a conference on the question of peace, and should then betray Sulla to himself. When he had a man of such importance as prisoner, a treaty would soon be concluded at the bidding of the Senate or people of Rome. A man of noble birth would not be left in the hands of enemies, into whose power he had fallen, by no cowardice of his own, but in the service of the state. The Mauritanian long deliberated on this proposal, and at length proposed to carry it out. Whether in this case his hesitation was real or assumed, my information does not say. The caprices of kings are as unstable as they are strong, and often clash with each other. Later on, the time and place for the assembly of the conference on the subject of peace was settled, and Bacchus addressed himself now to Sulla, now to the envoy of Jugurtha, treating each with courtesy, and made them both the same promise. They, on their side, were equally delighted and full of hope. On the night which preceded the day appointed for the conference, the Mauritanian is said to have first summoned his friends, and then, suddenly changing his mind, to have bidden them withdraw, and to have long debated the problem with himself, while his countenance and glance changed with each turn of his thought, and despite his silence laid bare the secrets of his breast. When he at last ordered Sulla to be summoned, and planned the treachery against the Numidian, according to his wish, at last day came, and it was announced to him that Jugurtha was not far off. Accompanied by a few friends and by our quaestor, as if to pay the king the compliment of meeting him on his way, he advanced to a hillock within an easy view of the men in ambush. The Numidian, with most of his intimates, approached the same place, according to the agreement, unarmed. The signal was immediately given, and he was attacked by the ambush upon either side. His companions were all cut down, and Jugurtha himself was delivered in bonds to Sulla, and by him conducted to Marius. During this same period, the Roman generals Quintus Caepio and Gaius Manlius were defeated in a battle against the Gauls, and all Italy trembled in the panic thus occasioned. From that day down to our own times, the Romans have believed that, while their courage can surmount all else with ease, with the Gauls their contest is for preservation, not for fame. In the present crisis, when it was announced that the war in Numidia was ended, and that Jugurtha was being brought in chains to Rome, Marius was elected consul in his absence, and Gaul decreed to him as his province. On the 1st of January, the general, who had won such renown, and was now consul for the second time, celebrated his triumph. At that crisis, the hopes and the resources of the state were alike centered in him. End of Jugurthian War And End of Works of Gaius Salustius Crispus Translated by Alfred W. Pollard